This is the Sons of UCF podcast, your place for UCF sports talk year-round. Now, here is Adam and Mike. Hey now, and welcome back to the Sons of UCF. This is the 142nd episode of said show. My name is Adam, and as always, my friend and yours, Mr. UCF Mike, is back for yet another week. Michael, greetings. How are you, my friend? Ready for another rip-roaring episode of Sons of UCF, man. Wow. I'm still excited off that big announcement from the Thursday show. Yeah. But uh, ready to get into the headlines here today. Yeah, we are in August, Mike. That means we are, uh, I forget the, whose jersey number it is today. I think it's... Uh, what Johnny Richardson number of days, twenty five number of days before the uh, the kickoff against Boise. So we are in prime time, and we will get you rolling and ready. We'll start off with some headlines, take you around what's going on in UCF's campus. Some news out of the football program today, which is pretty exciting, pretty interesting. A couple of comments that may have flown under the radar that, of course, you know, Mike and I are going to bring back. We'll have all that. We're going to have our preseason preview, so we're going to start doing some preseason stuff. I put together a pretty robust quiz for UCF Mike to answer, and so he will give you uh, his answers, which will serve as predictions for this year, so don't miss that coming up as well. Uh, great to catch up with uh, UCF legend Darren Slack, if you don't know who he is. Uh, he set a ton of quarterback records. He, you know, probably one of the guys who started UCF in, in this quarterback U type of path that they're on, so don't miss hearing about Darren's time at UCF, including the time the program almost ended and how he saved it. You're not going to want to miss that. So check that out. And then, of course, Cow of the Week will be at the very end as always because that's where cows go, Mike. They go at the end. So Action Pack Show. Make sure you follow us on social media. Sons of UCF everywhere. Follow Mike at UCF Mike one And make sure to check us out Thursdays live with Trey Stroko on the interwebs, Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. We'll be live there. So we have a lot going on. Football is just around the corner, Mike. But news broke today. And we've kind of known this news, but now we have some more official details. Jason Beatty of 24-7 Sports and soon to be of the Orlando Sentinel. Congrats, Jason, on that. Um, announced today or released today that a, uh, a board of trustees uh, agenda was, uh, uh, I guess, issued or released today, Mike. And on there, one item is UCF Stadium Naming Rights. 3MG, a local roofing uh, contractor company uh, with some UCF alums as part of their, uh, their C-suite. Uh, there's a, an offer on the table, Mike, 12-year, $20 million deal to make uh, the bounce house 3MG Stadium. That vote is on Wednesday, and if it's approved, uh, that's what we're looking at, Mike. So now that the cat is out of the bag, I think some of us kind of have known and suspected this is where it was going, but now that it's out of the bag, thoughts on 3MG, 12 years, $20 million. The numbers sound good to me. Now let's – get the thing done and signed because if we were very close to signing a deal with a roofing company last year and that all fell through our, our buddy randy fine found his way to stick his nose in there so hopefully this thing gets done if it does it's it's a good price it's more than we were getting out of spectrum and now we're going to be on to our third name the stadium has been around since 2007 started out as bright house network stadium and then to spectrum stadium bounce house for a year and now 3mg Good partnership. I, I believe the guys that run 3MG are UCF guys, so that's always good to see, too. Yeah, you referenced last year, so for those who maybe don't remember, UCF had allegedly had a deal that was offered to them. I don't know if we ever saw the actual numbers, Mike. I don't. Maybe I missed it. I, I, I don't really know. Uh, but the, the numbers that were essentially rumored back in those days were a uh, 15 years, $35 million deal for UCF to become roofclaim.com stadium. So if you want to put on your Shark Tank hat for a second, that would have put a $2.3 million a year valuation on the naming rights based on what Roof Claim wanted to play. UCF uh, and 3MG, if this deal goes through, if it's accurate as reported, that makes it a 1.66, Mike, which is still nothing to sneeze at. But are, do you have any, are you concerned are you frustrated that that you know the valuation has maybe dropped a little bit based on what uh what roof claim was offering allegedly back uh, back two years ago i mean you always want as much money as possible but the good thing is we have a name when i asked terry mahajer at the charge on tour if we would have a name before the season started he couldn't even promise me that hmm. so here we are three weeks before the season seems like we got a deal done i'll take it um, it's a little funny having a stadium named after a roofing company when the stadium has no roof. <laughs> I mean, if you want to look at it that way, <laughs> but I mean, we'll have any any business that's willing to invest in UCF and be a partner, then we're happy to take them. 
Yeah, obviously, you know, uh, while Bounce House was a fun little name, uh, you know, from a revenue perspective, and, and, and Terry has been very upfront about this, uh, he's looking at uh, trying to find ways to increase revenue. So obviously the football stadium is probably the flagship stadium on campus. I know when, well, what's funny, when Timo talked to you, Mike, at the Charge On Tour, you asked him the question and he did the very political answer and said, well, we've got a lot of stadiums that need, uh, need naming sponsors. So maybe this is just the first of many uh, hopeful deals to be announced soon that bring back revenue from a sponsorship standpoint. Yep, and we saw the naming on the um, the background during the press conferences, 3MG, so they kind of let the cat out of the bag last week. You see that on, on there. But UCF hasn't come out with a formal announcement yet. I guess they're just waiting on all the I's to be dotted and T's to be crossed here in the next couple of days, and then we should be official to go. Yeah, again, it's good to get, uh, get this off the plate. I know it's something UCF fans have been asking and talking about a bunch. Uh, it's something that obviously has been on our mind. I think everyone – uh, still has a little bit of a, a bad taste in their mouth based off what happened with roof claims. So uh, I don't know why roofers uh, seem to love the uh, the bounce house, Mike. But uh, you know, uh, again, I, I like that it's a it's a local company. It's a UCF connected organization. Uh, not that having you know something uh, really uh, like Disney or SpaceX, which I think is what people always you know assume that would happen. I think those have been really cool. But I think there's something kind of uh, kind of cool and nostalgic about having some UCF guys, some UCF alums. Um, some folks with ties to the school as uh, as part of the process. That's always good. You, you think they have a little more stake in the game that way. So um, I, I like that, that that's part of the deal. So stay tuned Wednesday. I guess a vote happens Wednesday, Mike. I don't know how quickly this stuff happens. I don't know if they vote Wednesday and they approve. You know, when, when we are on site September 2nd to, to watch UCF in Boise, are we watching from 3MG Stadium? I don't know how quickly they'll turn it around, Mike, but uh, I guess uh, Wednesday will we'll tell us some answers. Hopefully this, uh, this goes through that hiccups of, of last time. Uh, I think this is a much different scenario than the last opportunity with Roof Claim and what sort of their company uh, ethos was, but and, and by some that was not something favorable. So hopefully this goes through. So, so stay tuned Wednesday. Uh, and we'll find out if we'll soon be enjoying the Boise game from 3MG Stadium. That's right. And they got only a couple of weeks now to get signage and all that stuff up there on the stadium, right on the front of the stadium where it used to say Spectrum. Yep. Yeah, I get a th- big 3MG on there. A big 3MG, Mike. Well, uh, it may be being played in 3MG Stadium uh, if this all goes through, Mike. Uh, January 15th, 2020. Do you have any plans? Are you Are you around? Are you available? Do you know? 2020 we're going back in time uh so i'm sorry 2020 yeah maybe we should by the way 2022 my bad <laughs> 2022 january 15th 2022 do you have any plans um not that i know of. all right well maybe me you maybe some listeners let's head uh, head to 3mg stadium hopefully and we can check out the hula bowl mike because the hula bowl which uh as his name would suggest typically in hawaii cannot be played there based on stadium renovations. So the Hula Bowl is a college football all-star game. We've had a couple of our guys play in that the last couple of seasons. I think Jordan Johnson, I think Nate Evans played in that, if my memory serves. So the Hula Bowl coming to UCF, the UCF-Orlando-Hawaii connection continues, Mike. Uh, thoughts on the Hula Bowl uh, becoming a, a UCF thing, for at least for at least for a year, maybe more. I mean, we've already established the connection we've had with Hawaii now for the last few years with Mackenzie Milton and Dylan Gabriel, and now we got a bunch of other guys from Hawaii too. So it's a uh, it's a natural fit, I believe. And how cool would it be if Mackenzie Milton gets another game in 3MG Stadium? Mm. Uh, do you think we sell some tickets to that one? Probably. Well, I think that's what's interesting too is not that p- folks don't want to go to Hawaii, but obviously if you think about kids who are training for the combine, uh, they're they're trying to get themselves showcased, they're trying to uh, you know get agents. Getting out to Hawaii uh, is is quite an endeavor, particularly if you're an East Coast guy, if you're a Florida kid. Uh, so so I'm curious if this will attract some additional local talent, maybe in some some UCF guys. Uh, I think the the East West Shrine game is typically play, uh, played in St. Pete. We've seen a bunch of our UCF guys play there. So will will this being in Orlando, will this benefit our guys, get them on another stage? Will this get more talented guys out there? So I think I'm interested to see how the, how this game changes based on that, uh, just the geography being maybe a little bit easier for kids to get to. And you can't get much easier than having it in your own stadium. And you really so can't, no. I would, <laughs> I would think uh, any one of our guys, senior guys, is this game only for seniors or is this uh... – an all-star game that allows other classes. That's a great question. I believe uh, it doesn't specify here in the press release. I, I, I think it's just for seniors, though. All right. But I mean, 
we got a, a, a bunch of guys here that they, it's always good at the end of the year to get that one last shot to uh, impress some scouts. And if you can do it right here in your backyard, why not take it? Yeah. Well, yeah, I'm well, curious to see how, uh, you know, how, how this plays out. I wonder if us season ticket holders might ha- have dibs on these. I don't know. Uh, I'm sure we might get the uh, first, uh, first shot at buying them. You know, uh, they're not included in anything, but I'm sure that there'll be an offer out there. Maybe keep your cabana seats. There you go. So hula ball. So two stadium related items, Mike, off the top of the show. That's pretty exciting. Uh, but uh, obviously, we're probably more concerned about what's going to happen inside of the stadium, which is all still to be determined, Mike, as fall practice has now been underway for just under a week at this point here. Uh, really, uh, n- not a ton of news coming out. Uh, I mean, you're hearing some some things about the way that defense is competing. Uh, you're hearing some things about the way guys are kind of gelling together and some of the things that you're seeing and hearing, at least from from the press conferences, Mike. But really, the only two newsy items that I think have really been out there at this point are, A, we touched on this last week and now uh, now official, uh, the removal of Bentavious Thompson from the team. Uh, Gus Malzahn essentially said he's not with us. We wish him the best. Uh, no further information was provided. Obviously, everyone's got their theories and their speculations, uh, but at this point, it seems as though Bentavious' his time at UCF has come to an end, which is certainly a bummer uh, because I think we all enjoyed watching him play. You and I talked last week about, okay, well, if that's the case, you know, who's going to break out? And one of the people I picked on our list was uh, Mark Anthony Rich. Richards. And I said, hey, this, this kid, I think, may have a chance to, to sock, uh, sock, uh, sop up some carries. Well, it turns out, Mike, he hasn't really even been seen on the practice field, potentially nursing an injury. Um, not not something serious, but hasn't really been involved in practice to date so far. So uh, we went from being down one uh, running back to now potentially being down two. Uh, how concerned are you about uh, about the running back depth kind of dwindling here by the day? <laughs> yeah, uh, when you lose the the first guy you say, okay, we have a plenty of depth. When you lose another guy in the same week, then you start to get a little bit nervous, especially with a game only a a couple weeks away. Uh, We lose another guy and then we're really in trouble. So uh, I don't feel great about it, but again, we, we talked about so, so many guys ready to play. Uh, It's going to be a next man up. We we still have some experienced guys. We still have Bowser ready to go. We still have Johnny Richardson back there. We still have a handful of other guys that are ready to play at a moment's notice. So it's not good news, but hopefully this um, Mark Anthony Richards thing gets cleared up and he's ready to go too. Yeah. It sounds like it was a previous injury that, that he'd been nursing. Um, you know, I think some, some people have said, Hey, you know, it's not super serious, but he's just not ready for, for contact. He's doing some more, uh, some light stuff on the side. Uh, you know, he just hasn't been involved in some of the contact stuff. So, uh, but obviously anytime you're missing practice, particularly as a lead up to the season, you know, I think the rule has always been, if you can practice, you can play. Uh, and so I think that's the part where people are, are you know, are talking about that. If, you know, if he's not practicing at some point, when does it become panic time? Uh, uh, Isaiah Bowser, the transfer from Northwestern, Mike, he's a he's a he's a unit, man. I, I've you've seen pictures of him at, uh, at at practice. He's he's a he's a big fella. And obviously, we saw R.J. Harvey get a bunch of carries too. So we may start off this year where we thought we had a lot of depth and we thought it'd be guys fighting for carries. It, it may very well turn out to be that the Bowser and Harvey showed at this start off the season with a little Johnny Richardson sprinkled in. Um, how does that grab you for a, a backfield uh, trio? Yeah, I, I still like those three guys that you just mentioned. Um, there's a couple other ones too. Good. Uh, and uh, I'm, I'm blanking on the other ones right now, but um, uh, those three, I, I'll be okay going into the game with those three. Now, if you tell me now we're missing another one and now you, you cut it down to only two of those guys, then I'm starting to get pretty nervous going into that game. Yeah, I mean, I think Bowser has a ton of experience, although he hasn't, you know, hasn't necessarily been a stat stuffer, uh, but he's got a, a ton of experience. Um, and, and, you know, I, we saw a little bit of Harvey in the spring game. He played sparingly last year, uh, and, and he looked pretty solid in the spring game. So, uh, and, and we know that Gus likes to likes to run the football, uh, so that's going to be an important side of the ball to watch. So definitely, uh, definitely bears watching, Mike. Um, more exciting news today. I know you have to be just off the walls excited about this. Um, Alex Ward... Uh, our our long snapper Mike, uh, he is up for a uh, an award. Mike, he made the preseason Patrick Manley Award list for uh, best long snapper in the country. I mean, look, we've we've had some some quality uh, preseason watch list. The Patrick Manley list, I think, is where I mean, it's the top of the top, Mike, the creme de la creme of the of the long snapping community. To have our guy involved, that's pretty exciting, no? You're just trying to annoy me now. <laughs> well, watch I mean, I'm just trying. I mean, I got nothing else to do. We got time to kill. 
Like, I'm happy for Alex Ward. I, I love the kid. He's done, had a very nice career here. I think he's got a real shot to go to the next level. You know, we've seen Charlie Hewlett have a, a really long career. Yeah, it's true. Going to the NFL from UCF but as a long snapper. Why not Alex Ward? He's done just as well a job as anybody. Uh, I'm not taking anything away from him. My issue is not with him. My issue is with these watch lists itself. I mean, yeah, what is the point of these things? I just to... I'd never even heard. Who's the guy it's named after? Patrick Manley. Have you ever heard of that guy before? Never in my life. I mean, how many guys are on this watch list? Are we only supposed to be watching the guys on the list? What happens to the other guys? It's the same issue I have with preseason <laughs> rankings. Sure. Right? And we've, I've had this rant on here before. I, I know. know that. So, so the guys that are not on the watch list, they have no chance of winning this award is what you're telling me. I mean – I'm sick of a watch list. Mm -hmm. I don't understand why we even have them. Okay. And I think uh, we're ready to move on to the next topic. All right. And, and we uh, will. Uh, well, congratulations to Alex. Very good. Uh, <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> Mike does not want to take it anyway from you. Yeah, listen, obviously, it, it's a lot of, I mean, UCF uh, has got a lot of guys on these lists. And, and you're right. I mean, some of this is just a drum up. Uh, some some talking points and you know it's a good honor for the kids right to at least be considered and you know sort of you're being watched uh, and you have options to, to win awards but obviously ultimately the, the season has to play out before we get to there too so uh, but Mike one of your other uh, favorite guys uh, we haven't touched on this in the, in the last couple of weeks uh, he actually had some interesting comments at media day I've not talked to you about yet um, your number one guy Mr. Big Cat Bryant BKB for you. Uh, he was asked at media day uh, a question, Mike, and I, I, we haven't talked about his answer, so shame on me. He was, uh, Mike Bianchi kind of asked or baited, however you want to phrase this, into uh, you know talking about how UCF and, and playing some SEC teams, and, uh, and, and Bianchi basically said, how, how does UCF's roster stack up against SEC? And your boy Big Cat said, quote, right now, we'd beat somebody like Auburn for sure. We'd beat Auburn for sure, Mike. So you gotta love Big Cat with the confidence coming in new, kind of instilling that in the guys, saying that we are uh, we are an SEC caliber team. We can beat SEC caliber teams. Yeah, I think he threw Ole Miss into there too. Um, yeah, but what what is the kid supposed to say? No, we're not. <laughs> we're, this team is not as good as the team I just came from. There's nothing he can't say. That he asked him directly, would this team compete with those teams? He has to say yes, even if he didn't believe it. He'd still have to say it. I, I believe he does believe it. I think we've been saying it for years. Uh, UCF and even Cincinnati, the top teams in this conference can compete with any team in the country. Uh, they can compete and be just as good as these middle of the SEC teams, the middle of the A, A well, basically every team in the ACC, except for Clemson has been the only one that's really stood out from that group. So we're just as good as any of those teams. And I think he came out and said it. I don't even think it's really that newsworthy. But um, I'm glad he he's put it out there and he wasn't scared to say it. Yeah, I mean, what was he supposed to say, right? You're you're absolutely right. There's you know there, there's there's no other way. I guess he could have been diplomatic and said, hey, you know what? I think we can compete with anybody on any day and given Saturday. Uh, but you like the confidence, and and that's part of I think what Gus is potentially trying to do is bringing some of these guys in who have this confidence, have this experience to tell these guys, hey man, like we're we're I've played on some of these teams, I've played against some of these teams, and we are just as good, if not better, than those teams. And I don't know that we didn't always maybe know that already. But it's got to be, it's got to feel good uh, for these guys to kind of hear these things and uh, and see a guy like Big Cat, who again, I, I have a funny feeling like he's going to back that talk up too. By the way, uh, and I think that's one thing you can you can say anything you want, uh, just like you know Adrian Killens famously said that you know the, the Auburn hadn't seen speed like ours before, and then we went out there in that Peach Bowl and we backed it up. Uh, if, if Big Cat's going to back that up, I think that's uh, that's certainly a, um, a a nice way to to introduce yourself to to UCF fans and to your teammates. Yeah, he could have just went out there and said, "We want Bama." We want Florida now. We don't want to wait to 2024. That would have been newsworthy. Yeah. But, um, yeah, you know, Big Cat, from the early reviews I'm hearing, is having a nice fall camp there. He had a big day the other day from what I heard. So I'm excited to watch the Big Cat. You know me. Uh, I am pumped up about the Big Cat. I know you. Are you getting a Big Cat jersey? Is that is that happening? Is he wearing number one? Is he that is. Right? He is. I already have a big cat jersey then. Okay. I have a generic UCF number one in uh, anthracite. So. Okay. I, yeah, I got my big cat jersey. Oh, part, part, is that coming out on on the first uh, <laughs> the first week or what? Ooh, but it it's supposed to be wear black to that. I game. saw that. Yeah. That's, it's, it's not quite black. I don't. Know. I like to be part of the team. Okay. Everybody's wearing black. I'm going to wear black. Okay. I don't know if I can pull it off that way. Maybe the tailgate. We'll see. Yeah, uh, we'll see about that. Um, 
other comments, Mike, this, uh, this hasn't got a lot of news, but, and, and maybe this is in the department of we should just all move on and get over it kind of stuff. Right. But that's not what we do around here at the Suns UCF. We, we harp on things. We, uh, we, we get petty. We do conspiracy theories. Um, and so Mike Quadric Bullard, who is a, uh, a guy who played sparingly last year on special teams and uh, I guess a couple defensive snaps, found his way to the podium in a recent uh, press conference after practice. Uh, and uh, and I, I guess a lot of folks, not not a ton of bio on, on Quadric Bullard. And so uh, they had the first time really kind of talking to him. So a lot of questions were asked. And uh, our, our good friend uh, Brandon uh, Helwig uh, asked a question about the team vibe under uh, under Gus and, and sort of how the team vibe feels. And here's a quote from Quadric. I've spoken to all the players pretty much, and they say like it, it this this year because the coaches have a structure. They don't contradict themselves when it comes to any player. They have a standard, and you either meet it or you don't. Then our ace cub reporter, Trace Trelko, got in a couple questions later with a follow-up and basically said, you know, what did you mean by that? And uh, he responded, I would say in terms there's no favoritism. Even though they, the previous staff, said there wasn't any favoritism, you could clearly see it as a player firsthand, Mike. Not, not a lot of publicity out of these comments, so I figured we might as well stoke the flames a little bit. Uh, shots fired at Hypo and staff from uh, from Quadric? It sure sounds that way. Or I don't know if he's – we we discussed a million times how the offense and the defense last year were two different teams. Is that directed at Hypo? Is that directed at Randy Shannon? Hmm. Uh, I think we could look at it either way. Yeah. But, um, yeah, it definitely seems like – or maybe this is just a kid that didn't get as much playing time as he hoped last year, and sometimes kids think it's the coach out to get him or whatever it is. That's always a possibility, too. So, yeah, when you, when you talk about these 18-, uh, 19-year-old kids and the playing time, um, sometimes it, it can get a little distorted with their answers. I don't, I don't know how much I buy into it. Um, it's, I know he couldn't have said anything while the staff was here. Mm. Uh, maybe it's just something you don't want to say. I, got, I, I agree with your that premise on the favoritism part, right? Because everybody always thinks like, oh, your kids do it too. Like, oh, your dad's favorite, right? Everyone does it, right? Um, the, the part that I found most interesting is the, the statement, they don't contradict themselves when it comes to any player. They have a standard and you either meet it or you don't. That seemed more like a targeted, like there's something specific that he's thinking about or something specific that took place um, or that, that had taken place that um, that le- at least him and, and some other guys have, have been thinking through. Um, and I think that's interesting to, to think about because if you want to start playing conspiracy theory, we had a boatload of guys opt out. Um, obviously, we, we had a, guy, a lot of guys who were thinking about the transfer portal. Um, we'd always heard rumors, right? We had some guys go here and there, but not as, not as bad as other schools, but we definitely had the transfer portal stuff. Um, and, and so maybe this speaks to a little bit about how guys were, were really feeling about some of these things. And you got to think, to your point, his perspective is probably coming largely from the defensive side, since that's probably the, the side of the ball that, uh, that, that he spent the most time on. Um, so that, that one comment there is one that stuck out to me more than the favoritism stuff. Right. And remember, he's probably good friends with a lot of the other guys on defense that got kicked off the team. Maybe some of that didn't sit well with him the way that whole thing was handled. Maybe, you know, he's got closer relationships with those guys than the the former coaching staff. So maybe there's a little, uh, bad blood. I don't want to say bad blood, but just, you know, they didn't rub him the right way on the way out. But the reality is we should all get over this, right? Like we should all be like, Hypo's gone. Thanks for what you did. He's, he's on to Tennessee and we're on to bigger and better. We also just move on with this, right? Yeah, I, I'm ready to move past the Hypo era, even faster than, than I got past the uh, Frost era. I know a lot of people held on to that one for a while. I really, I, I'm done with Hypo's uh, regime here. I wish I, I I don't, I don't care if he does well or bad. I, I know people are rooting against him in Tennessee. People want to laugh at him. Whatever to me is it's not a non-issue. He was here. He did a, his job in 2018, and things kind of went downhill the last couple of years. And now he's out of here, so we don't have to deal with him anymore. Yeah, but it's better for ratings if we if we trash him a little bit now. All right, screw hype. All right, I hope he crashes and burns. <laughs> there we go. Tennessee. That's what I mean. Loses every single game mm-hmm. and gets embarrassed with his three offensive plays. How's that? Well, it's funny. Darren Slack later in the in the show will talk about uh, UCF at one point having only five plays. I was going to make a hypo joke at that moment, but he didn't <laughs> stop talking long enough for me to get the the joke in there. So, uh, so stay tuned for a, a foreshadowing of the hypo joke, Mike. But the other breaking news that uh, came out on our live show on Thursday that you announced, Mike, is uh, the Sons of UCF. 
we we often talk a very big game. We very, very rarely execute on anything around here. But on this one, Mike, the trigger has been pulled. We have actually made the arrangements. We have made the plans. Things have been set in motion. Contracts have been signed. Whatever needed to be done contractually has been completed, Mike. Uh, so tell everybody what's happening September 2nd, obviously the, the Thursday of the Boise game. Where are we Where are we going to be at? Where can they find us? Let, let's, let's break it all down for folks who maybe missed it during the live show. Man, I am excited about this. We have talked about it and joked around for a couple months now about getting together and doing a tailgate party for this first game. It's official now. You are coming to the game. I'm going to be there. We haven't been to too many games together. Actually, we went to the Boca Bowl, but before that, I can't even tell you. I think the last game before that me and you went to together was uh, the Boston College game in 2010, I think you were here for. So it's been not – it doesn't happen very often. We get to tailgate very much. And, mm-hmm. and Boca, we didn't tailgate, right? We just hung out at Hooters before the game for a couple hours. Yep. This is old school tailgating all day on campus right in front of the stadium. You can't get a better spot to tailgate at. Uh, I used to tailgate all the way by the communications building. But it was cool. Uh, my friends were out there and everything. But then you'd have to walk all the way across campus to get to the stadium. You make a pit stop here and there. We don't even have to do any of that. And everything is taken care of for us. I mean, we just basically got to just show up. The tent's going to be there. The tables are going to be there. The, the, the chairs are going to be there. We bring our own beer, and we're set. And I believe we can start as early as two o'clock, which is five hours before kickoff, which should give us plenty of time. Right. And we're right in Iowa Plaza. If you know the main entrance to the stadium, if you go to the main entrance, you will pass our tailgate and there'll be a sign on our tent that says sons of UCF. It's going to be the one where the party is. You're going to notice (laughs) us. We've gotten a pretty good response already for people that are interested in coming. It's going to be fun. You can come hang out with us all day. You can come and stop by for five minutes and say hello. Uh, whatever you guys want to do, but it's going to be fun. I can't wait for it. And um, that, that's it, man. But they tell me, I mean, I got to get a, a confirmation on this, but when you're tailgating where we're tailgating, we can use the bathrooms at the Nicholson Fieldhouse. That's how close to the stadium we are. Mm. So, I mean, th- this is high class stuff. And then the concert series, which has not been announced officially yet, but I saw Mohajer tweet about it, and I believe Jimmy Skiles is the man in charge of this one. He says there will be a concert series, and our tent is going to be set up right next to where the concert is going to go on. This is the happening place to be. This is Memory Mall well, on steroids. Wow. Uh, steroids are, are an important uh, <laughs> important thing, Mike. Yeah, I mean, listen, really excited to, to get out and meet everybody. Uh, you know, you can always count on Mike and I come up with an idea and two years later execute it. Uh, we did the same with our live pregame show. That took us about two years to figure out. We've been talking about trying to get something together for fans. Obviously, 2020 was a challenge uh, with no tailgating, so not not our fault. We get a mulligan there. But uh, definitely excited to, to meet a bunch of people. Uh, to Mike's point, come hang out for, for an hour, for a minute. Uh, you know, Mike and I are, are super excited to, to meet some people that we've only interacted with over the internet. Um, some people that maybe we've, uh, uh, we've talked to before, but uh, I've never had a chance to meet in person and, uh, and it'll be a lot of fun. I, I don't, I don't know what we're going to do. I have no idea. It could just be hanging out. could be some drinking. Maybe we'll find some games. I don't really know, but uh, either way, Mike and I are excited to, to hang out, meet everybody, um, and come on by it. Like Mike said, it's by the way, it's on the way to the stadium. So if you, if you've got your own tailgate, that's cool. If you want to leave your tailgate, maybe an hour or, you know, 30 minutes or whatever earlier, get, get towards the front, hang out at our tailgate for a little bit. That's perfectly fine. Uh, Obviously, we're going to close up shop early to get in the game, but uh, we, we, we're we looking forward to meeting as many people as we can. Uh, don't be afraid to stop by. We'll see if we can figure out some fun stuff to, while we're there, too, but definitely looking forward to uh, to having the, the first one in the books, Mike, the first real tailgate and, and the Sons of UCF party to to you know blow out the extravaganza that is the opening game. Yeah, I don't think I mentioned it, but tailgate guys is what the guys that uh, set us up with this, and we're thankful for them. Um, the cool thing about this is, too, they offer bellhop service. So you say you want to come hang out with us and you want to bring your own chair or you want to bring your own cooler. You can leave it there. These guys watch it during the game on your way out. You scoop it up. You head back to the car. You don't have to waste an hour heading back to your car, bringing your stuff back, and then walking all the way back to the stadium. No, no, no. That stuff's for the birds. We don't do that here at Sons of UCF. This thing <laughs> is – I'm telling we you. We don't walk, you can't no. Get a better, yeah. <laughs> you can't get a better setup than this. So – 
Let, let's do it, man. Let, now we got to figure out. You're right. We got this. We took care of the setup and all that stuff. We're gonna have our own drinks. We're gonna have our own food. You guys bring your own drinks too. But then, if somebody wants to bring a cornhole board. Somebody mm-hmm. wants to bring a, a couple of footballs to toss around. Some, a beer pong. Whatever you guys want to do, we can figure. We have tables, so I guess all we would need would be the cups and a, a couple ping pong balls. We could set that up. Uh, this is going to be an old school hangout. Just relax for a few hours before the game, the way you're supposed to do it. Uh, I, I can't tell that any better than he just did there. So, uh, so, so stay tuned. It's on our social media stuff. If we have any further announcements, we've also talked to a couple different uh, former players, people who've been on the show behind the scenes. Obviously we're trying to see if anybody wants to come by as well. So you never know, maybe a, a former knight will be walking around the tent that you can, you can stop by and say hello with and get a picture with. Uh, obviously we want to make this kind of a, a son's Yusuf extravaganza and everyone who's been so nice to us. Uh, that's former players. Obviously that's uh, that's everyone out there who listens to us who gives us, you know, maybe an hour or two of their life every week. Uh, so we want this to be for everybody. So uh, stop by September 2nd. Uh, I, again, 2 p.m. I think is when it starts. I don't know if any of you nut jobs will be out there at 2 p.m. I think Mike and I will be. Um, so that, that answers that. But anybody's uh, walking around early and maybe wants to hang out before their party gets there, before they get to their other destination, come early, come late, come often, stay as long as you want. But uh, let's have a good time, courtesy of the Sons of UCF Mike. And coming up next will be another good time. I'm going to give you the preseason quiz, which will serve as your predictions on a couple of fun items. We do this every year called the preseason sunnies. And so we will begin uh, part one of the sunnies coming up right after this. Don't you go anywhere except for our tailgate on September 2nd. This is UCF head football coach Gus Malzahn, and you're listening to the Future of UCF podcasting with Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Boom. All right, Mike, I don't know. Have you been studying? I don't know if you've been um, doing any any preparation here, but for those who are new, uh, each year Mike and I put out a couple of lists, a couple of predictions, if you will. We call it our preseason Sunny Awards. That's with an O, of course. Uh, and we, you know, we'll, we'll give you our prediction on MVP and the Marlon Williams breakout player of the year award, defensive newcomer, all that fun stuff. But a couple of years ago, we actually started doing kind of a, a fun sort of a, a, a prop bet kind of a quiz, Mike, different things that could happen, different things that maybe are a little less serious and maybe just topics that we want to talk about, Mike. So I've got a, a preview edition. This has not yet been released for voting and I don't even know if I'll release it for voting. Who knows? But uh, this is a, uh, this is the prop bet edition of the preseason Sunnies award. Mike, uh, are you ready to face this vaunted test? I'm, I'm, I'm curious what your answers are. Yeah, I can't wait to hear it. Some of these questions. I mean, we do come up with some weary ones sometimes. We so let's give it a, let's give it a roll. Here. All right, here's the first one for you, Mike. And this is a repeat of last year's. Um, the first quarterback not named Dylan Gabriel to take a snap in 2021 will be A. Quadri Jones, B. Mikey Keene, or C. Parker Navarro. First quarterback not named Dylan Gabriel to take a snap. Last year, I think we all said Quadri Jones. We were all wrong. That's correct. Right? So I've attempted right now, as we know, Quadri Jones is supposed to be the number two quarterback, but I don't even think that's official yet. Mm-hmm. And, you know, Malzahn came in. Everybody's got a, a fair shot to win the jobs here. I'm hearing good things about Mikey Keene. He's got a shot now to maybe even creep up to that number two spot. <sighs> this is a tough one. I will stay. Well, that's the other thing is you got to think about the game situation. That's right. Yeah. So the Boise State game, you're, you're thinking it's going to be a tight one. It's going to be a close game. If something, I mean, you don't even want to say, but if something were to happen to Gabriel and this, somebody's going to come in in a tight game, who's he bringing in? I think then you got to go with Quadri. He's got at least some experience. He's been around for a while. But if you're talking about mop-up duty, uh, like we did last year, to somebody to come in at the end of the game, you don't want – to even take a chance of your backup quarterback getting hurt in a situation like that. So maybe you bring in the third string guy, whoever Mm. that is. Yeah. So um, this is a tough one. Hopefully we we are able to uh, bring in a backup in that first game. Hopefully we're up by four touchdowns in the fourth quarter and, and we, we, we can get somebody else in there. I'll still say I'll stick with Quadri. I'll stick with a a safer, what I think that is Quadri will be the the first one. Okay. 
Well, so to your point, last year, uh, Georgia Tech game, we were up by a pretty decent margin, uh, and Parker Navarro trotted out there and took a couple of garbage time snaps and handoffs, not Quadri Jones, which I imagine um, definitely uh, gave Quadri some, some challenges. So the situation will matter, right, because it could be a deep blowout, and to your point, we just want to get somebody a quick snap, and Gus doesn't want to get anybody super injured, or it could be a situation where, you know, maybe uh, Dylan's cleat comes off and he's got a, you know, helmet pops off for a play and has to come out and they need a quarterback to come out and take a snap because Dylan can't stay on the field. So who do they trot out at that point? So you got to play the odds here. Um, I think the smart money, if this is a Vegas style bet, the smart money would be on Quadri Jones. So I'm going to go with you. I'm going to go with Quadri Jones. I think, you know, there's too many scenarios by which, you know, Dylan has to come out for one quick play or something like that that I think can happen throughout a game. Not that we maybe won't see some blowouts, but, you know, really be the, that week two game, I think, is where you got to circle, uh, you know, do we have an opportunity against Bethune to get somebody in there? You know, do we want to see quad um, sort of heated up or does he want to give Mikey Keene an opportunity? I'm going to go with you. Go. I'm going to go quad, although I'm, I'm not really confident in it. I'm not, this, is a, this is a complete guess on my part. And what about this? Factor this in. Uh, what about a wild night package? Mm-hmm. Does this count? Uh, an RJ Harvey back there? No, he's a running back. No, count? no, he's a running back. No, I see. What but, you, that's why I, I mean, said was, first quarterback. Because yeah, I agree with you. There probably will be some trickeration at some point. But a running back taking a snap as a quarterback. First quarterback, no. not named Dylan Gable. No. Okay. Those are your options. <laughs> Don't be smarter than the teacher on this one. Okay. Quadri Jones <laughs> is both our answers. Uh, who knows if we're right or not, Mike? Here's the second question. Which of these people will make the most field goals in 2021? A. Daniel Labarski, B. Riker Casey, C. Garen Boniel. Ooh, you know, to me, <laughs> we've discussed this a hundred times on here. Um, my confidence is not high in Mr. Obarski coming off last year. Um, the clips that we saw the other day, Gus Malzahn, was not happy with Obarski's performance, and he, he told him he's going to have to go for it on fourth down a lot of times if he keeps that crap up. I think that's a direct quote. So um, I'm going to go with Bonio because in that clip, he was the only other kicker kicking the field goal. I don't think Riker Casey even kicked the field goal in that situation. Mm-hmm. He may be more of a kickoff specialist guy. Mm-hmm. So give me Bonio as kind of a, a late entry into this field and taking over the job as the season goes on. Or if he, if he doesn't take it over to start the season. Yeah. Yeah, this is a tricky one because um, Boniel definitely does not have as strong of leg as Obarki. I think that's well documented. Even the you know the practice videos you saw, his, his kicks were kind of knuckleball style kicks, but they went in. Uh, obviously, Obarski, his, his struggles are, are well documented. Uh, Riker Casey, I mean, are we getting fooled by the internet on this one? Cause just because we didn't see him kick doesn't mean he's not kicking. Uh, and I think this is the a wide open race, um, and and certainly there there'll be some changes here. I'm gonna stick with Obarski, Mike. I'm gonna say Obarski will make the most field goals. I'm not saying he's gonna be the primary field goal kicker. I'm not saying it's not gonna be like four to three, uh, but I think Obarski will get a shot. We we know we've seen him hit field goals. I mean, he obviously hit you know some last year, right? He, although he wasn't the most accurate person we saw. Uh, Twelve of seventeen last year on field goals, so he does have experience. He's the only one on this list, I believe, to actually kick a field goal in a college football game. So he's got that experience going for him. I think he's probably, hopefully, done on kickoffs. Although we had a lot of uh, touchbacks last year, so maybe he stays on that too. Who knows? I'm gonna go. Obarski is gonna be the uh, the field goal maker of record in 2021. Look, we've seen UCF kickers struggle early and then go on to have good careers. Matt Wright's very first kick ever was blocked to lose the FIU game. Um, Javier Borleggi did not have a great couple starts to his uh, career either, but we know he ends up hitting the game winner against Alabama. So there's still time for Obarski to straighten this thing out. He comes in, he hits a game winner, he hits a, a big kick somewhere down the road here. He can be a hero. He can be a legend in UCF history going forward. He's got plenty of time to change the narrative on him. He does. Uh, I I hope he does. I hope he does it for his sake. But, I mean, just based off that one practice (laughs) clip and and the stuff we heard, we already know about him, I I just don't have confidence. Until I see it, um, it's going to be hard for me to say him. All right. Third question for you. Simple one. Will UCF have a special teams touchdown in 2021? Your options are yes or no, Mike. You know me, I'm the, the eternal optimist here. We've been due for one for a few years. And to get a special teams touchdown, 
can happen in many different ways. You're talking about kick return, a punt return. Yep. How about blocking a, a kick and returning it, yep. right? Yep. Or even Malzahn, I, I mentioned this before, his most famous play at Auburn was returning a missed field goal mm-hmm. for a touchdown. Yep. So uh, there's more than one way to skin a cat here. I think, you know what we're due for? We're due for like a block punt return yep. you know and for a touchdown we haven't seen that in a while it was a game the first year of the bright house um i forget who i think it was louisiana monroe or louisiana lafayette one of those where we blocked the touchdown right we blocked the punt and returned it for a touchdown and that was one of the first times i remember zombie nation really taking off the crowd got into it after that score um i think we're due for one of those and we're definitely due for a kick return so you're, you're talking about o'keefe back there he can be deadly. You give him some space. Um, I'll take my chances. I'll say yes. We do get a special teams touchdown at some point this season. Yeah, you know what? You took damn it. You took my answer. So I actually have yes as well. But I don't think it'll come in that conventional punt return, kick return for a variety, right? So last punt return, if I memory serves, was Otis Anderson against Pittsburgh in nineteen. Um, and then obviously the kickoff. I think it's Hughes' uh, um, reservation for six. I don't think we've had a kickoff taken back since then. So we're definitely due yep. in both of those categories. But I think you're. I think you're right. I think it's more of the um, the variety. Or do we see a fake punt and you know the the guy just busts up down the middle for a touchdown? Right? Uh, do you count a fake field goal? Like, would you count that as a special teams touchdown? Of course, yeah, special so, teams. I think I think you, you maybe see more of that variety versus uh, something of the traditional return. I'm not saying that's out of the question, but I've, I, I answered yes to this. My thinking is more of that: a blocked punt, fumble on a uh, on a punt return that we uh, scoop and score on, um, something along those lines. I think are probably the better play for the touchdown. So I say yes, but I think it's going to be the maybe the less conventional route versus a return. Yeah, that, I mean. We're due, man. We are due. So you, you mentioned the last times we had the kicks return. So, and, and we were spoiled for so many years. So many different guys able to return kicks. Uh, I hope we do see one because that's one of the most exciting plays in football. All right, here's your next question, Mike. Over under 24 and a half receptions by somebody listed on the depth chart as a tight end. Over or under? By one tight end or tight ends all tight ends all together. I mean, you're talking that's two per game, Mm -hmm. just over two per game. Um, You know, (laughs) we don't know. We know if this was the hypo offense of the last couple of years, there's no chance. Yep. But Malzahn coming in, bringing in a whole new system. I mean, all it takes is one game of Hescock getting six catches. And then that, that number becomes a lot more reachable. It does. Uh, yeah, but I'm one of these where I haven't seen it in a few years. It's hard for me to say. Oh man! And then <laughs> you be okay, Charlie Browder. Yeah, he's Charlie the Browder. Freshman, right? Yep. He, he he could be a, a yep. weapon. Um, you know, I'll say yes. I think we can go two catches per game, and then there's a game in there where Hescock is just slicing somebody over the middle or something, and um. He can make this number. I think 24 is reachable. 25, I guess it'd have to be, right? Yeah, Mike takes the over. 25 receptions. Just for context, Jake Hescock's entire UCF career, he has 21 receptions. He had 10 last year, 9 the year before that, and 2 the year before that. Obviously, this year we throw in Charlie Browder, who if you're at the spring game, uh, he actually showed out pretty well. We didn't see a ton of like two tight end sets, but we definitely saw Charlie Browder as more of a receiving option. I think Hescock has typically been thought of as more of the blocking type option. Um, and, and Malzahn's offense, he has, certainly has used that that uh, that H back style position. If you guys remember the his run at Auburn, Lutzen Kirker, I think was one of the guys' names uh, who uh, who ended up catching a lot of uh, the swing passes from Cam Newton at, the, at that time. So, twenty five receptions is certainly a lot, Mike. Uh, for for context, that would have put him uh, if if that takes place. And again, it's it's amongst a few different guys that would have made um, last year that would have been the fourth most catches on the UCF team. Now, again, you can spread this out amongst different guys. So I'm going to go with you. I'm going to say yes, that we will get to the 25 reception mark. I think I agree with you. I feel like there's going to be a game or two where the tight end will be will be open. 
and different, hopefully different than the hypo regime. I think if Malzahn finds a matchup, finds a, an area that he can exploit, I think he's going to try to exploit it where hypo just try to continue to find ways to exploit what he wanted to do. I think if, if Gus looks at the first quarter and is like the middle of the field is wide open, I think he will start rolling tight ends and, and giving Dylan some easy passes to ten, connect on. So I'm going to put this more as a faith in Malzahn. I think obviously Hescock and Browder and, and Jordan Davis can catch the football. Zach Mark, Wojan or yeah, Mar- yeah Zach Marsh Wojan so I'm gonna go over with you as well but by like a skinny margin like 26 it's gonna be close I was just looking up now Kalubiali's stats yep. and in 2018 he caught 21 he did. himself uh, years before that only 10 and 2 oh man I'm gonna have to go back and check all the hit the Jordan Aikens years ends, though or... right hit the so if you go Jordan Aikens 2017 hold on I'm pulling it up right now Jordan Akins in 2017, 32 catches. Still, that's not that much more than 25. And he was a big time. Seems like he had more, right? And I would have thought Hescock had more than, well, what you said, 10 last year? Yeah. Uh, but in 2017, again, this was the Frost offense. Uh, Akins, 32. Kalubiali had 10. So you had 42 going to the tight end that year. Okay. All right. Yeah, that's a little different. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Life's <laughs> <Mike's> good. <laughs> I'll stick with the yes, just to be optimistic guy. All right. Op- optimistic Mike is really. But in the year prior to that, actually. Hold on. So the 2016, Aikens had 23. Jordan Franks, I think, was technically a tight end, right? He had 11. Uh, Cal Bloom, who's now a wrestler, had two. And Kluby Ali had two. Again, different offenses. So it's I guess it is possible if you want to throw it around. All right. Here's your next over-under then. Dylan Gabriel, TD passes in 2021. Over-under 30 and a half. All right, again, you got to start doing some math. That's less than three per game, more than two, obviously. It's about two and a half per game. Um, it, I got to take the over on that. I, I know we don't expect them to put up as big numbers and, as he did the last couple of years. That's kind of been the thing we've been saying. And we, Malzahn is a run-first guy. But I still think he's going to have to – a few games where he just lights it up. And, and I, I think he's going to have a couple four-touchdown games in there. So – Give me the over on that. I'm not saying he's going to throw 40, but I think he'll throw more than 30. In his two seasons as the quarterback at UCF, he's threw 29 and then last year 32. So this is kind of right in that midpoint of what he's produced from UCF at this point. And that's under the hypo offense, which was typically a, a, a much more throw heavy offense. I think a lot of folks think that um, that Gus wants to, to run the ball a bit more, Mike. I'm going to take the under. Um, and I'm, I'm going to say 29, 30 is probably in that number, which I wouldn't be a bad season, but I'm going to, I'm going to take the under on this one. Um, and not cause I don't think Dylan's talented enough and not cause I think he's going to have a bad year, but I think uh, the offense will dictate some things a little bit differently. You know, will we be on the field as much, uh, if we're going to play a little bit more ball controlled. So I'm going to take the under, I'm going to say he's probably at that 29 or 30 mark. All right. I mean, you gotta figure there's some games in there where if he doesn't get them early, he may not. Like the uh, Bethune game yep. or the UConn game, if he doesn't have at least two or three touchdowns by the half, he may not get any more. In the second half, we'll be up by so much. But if he, those are also games where he can throw four in the first half. You know, yep. finish with five, six touchdowns. Um, I don't know. It's a, it's a tough number, and without seeing the Gus offense in at UCF, it's hard to to make predictions with any of these things. But I'll take the over just because that's the way he's trending. You said he went from 29 to 32. Yep. I see another 32 to 35 touchdowns. All right. Next question for you then. Who will have the longest touchdown reception of the season? So actual number of yards. Doesn't matter if they, if it's, if it's the yak or if it's, uh, they catch it, you know, a bomb in the end zone. Who will have the longest TD reception in 2021? Jalen Robinson, Caden Robinson, Ryan O'Keefe, Amari Johnson, or other. Now it's got to be a touchdown, not just the longest reception. You can have an 85-yard reception, but it's not a score. That doesn't count. That's correct. Uh, we saw what O'Keefe could do just on a little screen pass last year, and he can score from anywhere on the field. What was that, 80-something yard, 87-yard touchdown last year against Memphis. Uh, and we know also what Jalen Robinson can do. He can burn you deep, and uh, we know how good Dylan Gabriel is with those deep passes. So I'm just going to say – Give me Flash. Give me Robinson. Just because I think he's going to be the main target and have more opportunities. How's that? Yeah. Give me um, 
I'm going to go with, I think Jalen's a good option. That's a, that's a good choice, Mike. I, I like that option. I'm going to go with, um, give me Ryan O'Keefe again. Give me, give me Ryan O'Keefe. I think we saw him get the ball a bunch in the spring game. Again, if, if that's an indicator of anything, we know he's got breakaway speed. So if Dylan even hits him on a quick little slant and he just gets a bit of a wiggle, we know he's got the speed to, to go. Not that Jalen doesn't have the speed to do that as well. Uh, but uh, you saw a lot of slants and crosses, uh, at least uh, under Gus in the spring game. So I'm going to go back with O'Keefe. Again, he had, I think it was a 93-yarder against Memphis, which was a bit of a swing pass to the outside, and he took it to the house. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stick with him. I'm going to say he goes back-to-back, um, and he's going to have the longest TD reception. Yeah, you can't go wrong. And you know who the sleeper is in that group is Amari Johnson. Mm-hmm. You've seen some explosiveness out of him. Uh, his very first game against FAMU a couple of years ago, he scored on that uh, on a pretty long pass. Uh, I'm looking for good things out of him too. And then you got the transfers, the Johnson transfers. Um, I'll still stick with with Flash, but uh, anything's possible. This is a very explosive group out of the wide receivers. Just to follow up on that last one, I was doing some research while you were talking there. My Gus Malzahn quarterbacks under Auburn. Um, he's had some decent ones and some not so decent ones. But just checking, uh, the lost, uh, the last guy to actually throw 20 or more TD passes was 2013, I think it is. Nick Marshall only threw 20. That's the highest total of TD passes a quarterback under Gus Malzahn has thrown uh, since 2000 and uh, I guess 11 when he took over. So nobody's wow. thrown more than 20 TDs under Malzahn's offense. Now, can we go back and look at his Tulsa days? where he was chucking the ball all over the place? Because i got to figure those guys. I, who was it? Paul Smith? They had a couple different Smiths at, uh, now Cam, at quarterback. The year he was OC, Cam did throw 30. So in 2010, Cam had a, a 30-piece uh, touchdown passes. Right. So. Uh, you know, but they're also going up against SEC defenses, a different style of play over there. That yeah. whole factor in too. So. Um, just trying to give you, you know, the context. Dylan, yeah, just want, want to throw yeah, the context Dylan, in I, there. <laughs> I think Bill is better than Bo Nix than the other guys he's had. So I'm, I'm sticking with that answer. You trying to scare me off that answer? No, I just, as you were sure. talking, I was like, you know what? I didn't research that. I, I pride myself on all this great research over here. And I had no well, clue make, who actually did that. You're making me research the 2007 Tulsa team. I'm actually looking up right now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to filibuster. Yeah, I have my, a feeling those guys threw the ball around. My computer is taking forever here. Hold on a second. So let's go to uh, 07 Tulsa. Quarterback was oh Jesus <laughs> was a guy named Paul Smith. Paul Smith, I told you. And Paul if I'm looking at this correctly, in 2007, Paul Smith threw 47 touchdowns. <laughs> yeah, that's right, 47, <laughs> 5,065 yards. Yeah. So that is the Gus Malzahn okay. offense we're looking for here. All right, fair enough. Um, that's the team that we beat up twice that season. I believe it was almost identical scores, 44 to 25 or something both times. So, and then was uh, was he there in 2008 or did he leave? Because the next guy, uh, David Johnson, threw 46 touchdowns. <laughs> All right. See? How did Tulsa not win more games? What was going on back then? <laughs> well, Tulsa won some games. They were in the championship game yeah, with us. They were 11 and three, I guess that year. Wow. Good yeah. for them. So, 47 touchdowns, 5,000 yards. You take that out of Dylan this year? I'll, I'm good with that. I'm good with that. <laughs> and then in 09, uh, poor GJ Kinney came in, only threw 22. Loser. Yeah. Boy. <laughs> all right, all right. He's one of our guys now. I know, but I'm saying loser. Come on, more than that. All right, here we go. Um, where am I at here? Next question for you, Mike. Will UCF have any games canceled or forfeit in 2021? Now, remember, uh, Mike Oresco basically says if you if you have to forfeit a game, it's a loss. You're not replaying that thing. You don't get a redo. So, will UCF have any games canceled or forfeit? Doesn't mean it's their fault. Just means a, a game will not be played on the schedule. It's a yes or no. All right. I already told you I'm the eternal optimist here, but I don't want to jinx us either. So I'm going to do a little reverse mojo here. I'll say, yeah, a game gets canceled at some point. May not be our fault, but a team that we're supposed to play, um, you know, I don't, I don't know how many games are actually going to get canceled. Now I'm thinking about it. There, there's just maybe games where teams travel, like last year, the, the Temple game where the team came to town with only 40 guys, 45 guys, or whatever it is. I think it's going to be hard to get a, a forfeit. Uh, you never know. A team like UConn, ah, late in the year, you took my them. <laughs> <laughs> they may have already given up on things. It, the the, the uh, civil conflict trophy is nowhere to be found. <laughs> and these guys have no motivation to come down here. Um, that that would be the one game. I think I mentioned this before. That would be the one game where if it did get 
canceled. And we were in the middle of, say, an undefeated season. I don't think that one could hurt us in the polls. I think, um, you know, we, we would get the the benefit of the doubt of beating UConn. So that would be the one game I guess we could afford to have scrap up because of that or the uh, Bethune game, I guess. But uh, hopefully none. But just for the sake of the question, I'll say yes, there will be a game at some point. Yeah, I had, I had, so it's funny. I had two options in there. Um, I had UConn, and I think it's a, it's a quasi COVID related reason, right? Because at that point, UConn's going to be dreadful. I mean, they had a hard time filling a team out to begin with. Um, you know, the, the, you know, the season will be long, you know, at the, at the end at that point. Yeah, I feel like it's one of those things where they get two or three guys who hopefully don't, but maybe possibly test positive or contract, uh, contact trace. And they're all like, yeah, we're not, we're not doing that. Um, but don't forget hurricanes, Mike. We've had the issue with hurricanes in the past. Uh, and obviously we know that hurricane season is just, is just kind of ramping up now. Uh, and so if you think about our early games, the Bethune game was actually another game that I kind of had a little bit circled to say that if, if there's any impending weather or something like that, that could be a game that, that maybe gets canceled or something and we just don't have the need to throw it back on the schedule. Um, and so it ends up getting canceled and we don't end up playing it. So now I think in a hurricane scenario, there could be a postponement for those kind of things, right? Which wouldn't count in for in terms of this question. So I'm going to go with a yes, just because to your point, I want to just let's let's just get it out of the way now and assume something bad's going to happen and hope that it doesn't. And my two likely candidates are UConn want a no part of coming down here and uh, and Bethune maybe getting a little bit of a weather situation. Yeah, mine, mine didn't even go to the hurricanes right away until you, you started mentioning it. That's always a possibility. <laughs> and it seems like it happens every year. We had about four or five years in a row where a game got canceled for a storm. Sometimes we pick up an Austin P along the way, and sometimes you can't make anything up. So <laughs> fair. I, I hope not, man. And if the Boise game gets canceled for a storm, I'm going to be very disappointed because it's going to ruin the tailgate party. It's going to ruin everything. So hopefully none of those come our way. All right, next one. The highest ranking UCF will have in 2021 will be A, they won't be ranked, B, top 25, C, top 20, D, top 15, E, top 10, F, top 5, Mike. Highest ranking at any point in time during the season for UCF is going to be what? Does this include the Kali Matrix rankings? Or is um, this just a I don't have it. Quick, AP. Let's just, let's just go AP coaches poll. Coaches poll. All right. Well, we're starting the season outside the rankings. I think, well, we don't know that officially. Comes until, out a, I week from, week. a week from today, yeah, the 16th. But I can't see them ranking us coming off a six and four year last year. And we already know they're going to rank Cincinnati high. I doubt they're putting two American teams in there, especially the AP voters. Uh, so it's going to take us maybe a week or two to get into the rankings. We beat Boise, and depending on how we beat them, there's a chance we get in there after week one. At least we're getting some votes. If we start out 3-0 and with a win at Louisville, I think for sure we're in. But then you're talking about being 23, 22 in that range. Uh, then you got the big game against Cincinnati in October. If you can win that one, or say even if you lose that one, we lose one along the way, that'll knock you down a few pegs. Uh, give me top 15. Top 15, but it, you know, possibly, I, I don't think we can get higher than eight even if we went all the way. Even starting from where we're starting now, so you got top I don't think 10. they'll put us higher than eight. So you got top 10. Yeah. I, uh, all right. Give me top 10. Okay. So Mike's got, Mike's got eight <laughs> as his, uh, as his ceiling there. So here, yeah, I think you do the calculus on this, right? So I think if we beat, we're not ranked to start. I think that's a fair premise, right? I think that's probably fair. We're probably in that others receiving votes category, but I don't think we're ranked. If we beat Boise handily at home, I think that probably creeps us up into that like 26, 25 area. Obviously, we take care of Bethune. If we go on the road and beat a Louisville team, I think at that point we're in the top 25, or to your point, we're in that 22, 23 range. Then we got a tough Navy team. You know, we beat them. You know, maybe we move up a spot. Somebody loses. Who knows? East Carolina, as long as we don't stub our toe, probably not a lot of movement there. So I think I've got us in that 21, 22 range going to Cincinnati. I think if Cincinnati's undefeated, I think they're going to want the, you know, an undefeated, uh, you know, ranked UCF and an undefeated ranked Cincinnati. 
probably frankly because it helps Cincinnati, right? I think people want to see that. But if we then upturn Cincinnati, there's the challenge is now we're starting from from way far behind. And at this point, we're going to have we're going to need Cincinnati to have beaten Notre Dame to make sure that they are ranked as high as they could be ranked. So that's the other wild card here. Is if Cincinnati stubs their toe and loses to Notre Dame, uh, I don't know if they play Indiana before Notre Dame or us as well, but if they, they have a couple of losses coming in, this could be a 22 versus 23 type matchup. Even if we win that, I mean, that vaults us maybe into the top 15 area, right? That gets us like 17, 18, 19. After that, then Memphis, Temple, Tulane, SMU could be an option, Connecticut, and then the Cows. Um, not a lot of, of, of ability to move up, so we're going to need a lot of upsets there, so... I think Gus Malzahn helps us at this point, but I actually think you were, your first answer was probably more correct. I'm going to go top 15. Uh, I think we get ceilinged out around like an 11 spot, um, and I think uh, it really depends also on the championship game too. If, if Cincinnati is, is out and they lose a couple of games, who do we get in the championship game? I think that'll matter as well. Um, so I'm going to go top 15. Give me like an 11 for, uh, for our, our highest ranking. Tell me you can't see this possibly happen. Cincinnati beats Indiana. They beat Notre Dame. How high are they ranked coming into our game? I mean, they're probably going to start the season top 15. Yeah, for sure. If they win those games, they're you're talking what? They're eight, top. Yeah, they're seven? top seven or eight for sure. Coming into that game. Now picture this. UCF is what? Five and zero oh going into that game. I mean, beat Louisville. We're in the top 25 for sure. They were 17, 19, something, somewhere in that range. Mm-hmm. They're seven. We beat them. Mm-hmm. Are they still ranked higher than us? Do they drop that far? Do we do we raise up that high after that? I, I we've seen it happen millions of times before, where a team beats a team and still is not ranked higher than them. Is that out of the realm of possibility? It's it's not. You know, you're not wrong. I mean, typically in the group of five area, like they, if you lose one, they they move you down. Like they don't, you don't have the same tolerance as you get like an SEC school or whatever. Um, but you're right. The body of work we would have played at that point depends on what happens to Boise, right? If we, if we beat Boise and then they just fall apart, then that's a problem. But if, if Boise is having a good season and they're able to continue winning, you know, that, that helps our cause if they're good too. I, I wouldn't be shocked if it was like, you know, a, uh, a, a number, you know, 12 Cincinnati, number 13 UCF situation. Um, at that point, I guess it wouldn't surprise me, but I guess, I think for a group of five, they typically would put them a notch below us would, would typically what they do, but nothing shocks me with the way these idiots vote. <laughs> yeah. But if they beat a Notre Dame, I don't know where they're coming in ranked to start the year. Is that, I got, I think probably top 10, Yeah. right. And if they're, if they beat a, a top 10 Notre Dame on the road, they're going to get a lot of credit for that. They're going to shoot up the rankings on that one. Um, I don't know, man. The polls are so stupid. We talk about this every year. They shouldn't come out with the polls until at least a month has been played. But this is the life we live. But I'm curious how much Gus Malzahn helps to the national narrative, right? Because I think the, 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 the Danny White stuff with the championships and all that, I think we became like quote unquote annoying. And I think there were people who wanted to keep UCF down and and make sure that we didn't get too, too far along and so on and so forth. But after we went two straight years not losing a game, I think that became really challenging, particularly when, you know, uh, game day came to town and we kind of showed what the potential of the of the program and the stadium and the fans, all that stuff. I think we became a bit of a, a darling and, and so on and so forth. And we were getting inroads until uh, we lost that pit game. So I wonder how much the Gus Malzahn redemption tour story is going to play. And does that turn us into a, a, a better quote unquote story. Will people be wanting to get Gus up there because they want to kind of have the redemption item and yada, yada, yada. You know, I think there was a bit of a black hat that UCF had to wear for some period of time, but does Gus kind of erase all that? And does he now become a cool redemption story? Like you can see the CBS, you know, you know, uh, or the ESPN college Dame gay piece on Gus saying that thing. Well, I told my wife when the phone rang, we're going to UCF. Like you can see that happening <laughs> right now. Right. So uh, does, does that help us from a poll perspective? Yeah, I think Gus has a very good reputation around college football. I think people are rooting for Gus. Even the, the Auburn fans, I've seen nothing but good things coming out of the Auburn fans, even on places like Twitter. And that you know, Twitter is the place, uh, it's basically hell, uh, especially <laughs> for, for fans to talk trash about people. Uh, and I haven't seen anybody say bad things about Gus. So uh, I think it would be a very good story. People are, would be happy for him and this is a place that has just been waiting to explode, man. We talk about the sleeping giant forever. I don't think we're a sleeping giant anymore, but 
Gus is the guy I think that can come here and put us over the top. Well, let's not kid ourselves. Cincinnati had a good year last year, right? I mean, again, I, I would argue that they had some games canceled. They didn't make him up, whatever, whatever. But let's let's be honest. Everybody loves Luke Fickle, right? Everybody loves like he's a, he's a player's coach. He's a man's man. He wears team on the back of his stupid, you know, windbreaker jersey situation. Everybody loves Luke Fickle, and so I, I think that that helped Cincinnati vault itself into you know the national conversation. At Coastal, I mean, they had a great season, and and, and I think they became a cute little story. But I think. They didn't. Who were people latching on to there? I think people love Luke Fickle. And so I just wonder if we have that guy now, right? No one loved Heupel, um, except for maybe like the Shoney's Buffet. But nobody really loved Heupel, right? So do we now have that guy that people love? I think so. I think we do. And he's definitely more personable than a George O'Leary or a Heupel. So I think we finally got the right combination. No, we got to see it on the field. We got to see the results. But this guy has proven he can win football games at big time places. So he, I, I have full confidence in him to come in here and do it. And he seems to have a good rapport with the media. So I think this could be it. This could be the match we've been waiting for. I feel bad about that Shoney's buffet joke. Cheap shot. Yeah, it was a little cheap. All right. I think he preferred Dunkin Donuts. That's right. They don't have a buffet though. Um, all right. Last one for you. Here we go. This is Dylan Gabriel's last season playing at UCF. Yes or no? You mean no? Ooh, all right. No, every, every everybody is thinking he's gone after this year, you know. And if he has the season that we were talking about, forty-seven touchdowns and five thousand yards, and he's getting uh, reviews from the NFL saying he's going to be a first-round quarterback, then yeah, he's gone. But I mean, this is a different world we live in now. If he does have a big season like that, um, he can get paid here in college and we've seen quarterbacks come back for their senior years that could have easily have left i mean dante culpepper (laughs) case in point dante could have easily have gone after his junior year decided to come back for a year what if um dylan and gus have this really great year together he loves working with gus and we see the potential of the program and gus says give me one more year let's get to the playoffs We, we just missed the playoff this year but get me there next year does he come back next year and now that he can get paid here and he's going to be a Heisman uh, finalist or or he's up for the Heisman for next year, there's a lot of marketing that goes into that. There's ways to make money. Uh, you can take out an insurance policy if he has to. Sometimes you hear quarterbacks say, I wish I would have sticked around for that extra year. Peyton Manning came back for a senior year. I mean, <laughs> God, it has happened before. And I don't think he's guaranteed. He's not going to be uh, rated as the number one quarterback in the draft. So... I think there's a possibility. I know everybody thinks he's out of here after this year, but he can come back and set records. He could be the all-time greatest quarterback at UCF. If he wins the conference this year, he can come back. He'll be the only guy to, he could be the only guy to ever win two conference championships as a quarterback. He can set every quarterback record there is. So I think there's a lot to, for him to come back. And all we need is a big-time booster to <laughs> say, hey, here's a million dollars. Come back for another year. Yeah. I think he's back. Yeah, this is a tough one for me because everything you said makes a ton of sense, right? With NIL stuff, he, he's already out there with a lot of different options. His Rock'em Sock stuff has been out there. Obviously, his DG the Brand stuff is out there. And again, all it takes is potentially, you know, a car dealer or somebody. You, you never know to, to step up and say, hey, you know, th- this is somebody we're going to pay. So to your point, he could continue to make uh, financial moves in UCF uh, uh, while he's there. So that doesn't necessitate he has to leave. I think the Gus offense is interesting because I think there's probably a bit of a knock on guys who play only in one system. I think that he probably would have gotten picked apart, you know, never been under center, doesn't throw this kind of route, only throws these routes. I think getting tutelage under Gus under another system, you know, making different kind of throws could and will make him more attractive to, uh, to NFL guys, but will he have enough time to really kind of show and prove in that system? And will he need another year to do that? Obviously his measurables NFL is getting a little bit more comfortable with smaller guys, but I mean, Dylan, I think what six foot. Uh, and so you don't see a ton of six foot guys um, who are getting opportunities uh, all over the place. I mean, it does happen from time to time, but you know, does the size hurt him? But I think here's the other factor, Mike, he saw up close and personal. Now he wasn't here, but obviously he knows he saw his good friend, Mackenzie Milton go through a pretty catastrophic injury that changed the trajectory of his football career. And obviously Casey's on the road back and we hope great things for him, but obviously things changed dramatically for McKenzie at that point. Is that something Dylan's willing to risk if he has a good enough year, despite all the things that, you know, maybe are still here left for him at UCF. So 
I'm going to say yes. This is his last year at UCF. I think he potentially will try to continue to even grow his brand. I think he'll always have UCF in his back pocket from that perspective. Uh, as long as he has, a, I think, a, a good to, to a good to great season, I'm going to go yes, this is his last year. Because I think he, I think the McKenzie stuff, seeing him get hurt and knowing how quickly that changed, I wonder how much that will factor in. Yeah, I mean, that's always a factor. But like I said, there are insurance policies that yep. these kids take out and – if he were to get hurt, he can still make a, a good money, a good amount of money on it. So, uh, one thing that I'm sure I'm not the first to think of this, but and I'm sure there are rules against it. But like we know, there's always been cheating in college football before. Never heard of right? it, right? So, what what school is going to be the school that gives the uh, car dealership five million dollars and says, "Hey, give it to this guy to come to our school, or give it to this guy to stick around for a year"? Uh, that's going to happen, right? Yes. <laughs> Where the schools are basically paying the players just in a roundabout way. Yes. Yeah, sure. You have a booster who's going to give the money to the car dealer who's going to then give – it's basically like money laundering at that point. Not, not even not even the, a booster. The school itself. I sure. Mean, the SEC TV contracts, they're making an absurd amount of money. I, I know they probably don't want to give up any of that money. But if they really wanted a, a guy, I'm yeah. sure they could find a way to you know, put a couple mil on the books over here – and and pay the, the student indirectly. Yeah, no, I'm sure there's that's a, gonna happen. They can bag man it to the to the local Volkswagen dealership, right? Who will then sign said starting quarterback to some sort of a contract. I, I mean, I'm sure all creative options are being explored in SEC offices everywhere right now, and that's probably one of them. Uh, and so, yeah, in theory, th- there is money to, and that's really the the thing that changes your mind about this is there's money to be made if you're Dylan Gabriel in Orlando being a part of the UCF program, particularly if we're winning, particularly if he's playing well, right? There, there's money to be made. Dear King is out here like cleaning up on deals. Uh, he signed a day with the Florida Panthers, which is an odd uh, mix, but you know, Dylan Gabriel is supporting the, you know, the predators or supporting the, uh, you know, supporting the magic or, you know, wh- whatever, like there's all kinds of options. Uh, and it, it's, 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 it's a different landscape. So it'd be really interesting to see how this first crop of guys um, considers it. But, you know, I think we have to brace ourselves to the fact that Dylan's probably going to have to make this decision. And, and if he has a good enough year, he'll definitely make this decision, which is what we want him to have. So I think we all need to brace ourselves at some point, not now, let's not worry about it now, but I think it's something that's going to be looming as the season goes on. I remember going to New York one summer. Uh, this had to be early 2000, maybe the year 2000, 2001, whatever it was. I get off the train. I come out into Times Square, and I see a billboard that says Joe, Joey Harrington. Joey Heisman. Harrington has crossed off. And Joey Heisman, right. Yep. And imagine the money they probably could have made off him, or he could have made off the marketing of that. If Dylan has a big year this year, come back next year and market that Heisman campaign. Remember, we started doing it with Milton, yep, right? Yep. We started giving out the lays and all that stuff. Dante, our freshman year, there was a, a campaign for Dante. Now he could do that and cash in on it. I think he can make some money, man. If he sticks around for one year, um, it's going to be a big decision for him. But and like I said, if he's not graded as a first-round quarterback, I think he, for sure he's back. Yeah. We'll see. I mean, I guess it, it depends on the season, how UCF goes and how, how he plays. Because I think, you know, a lot of it will be scout specific because if the numbers are going to come down a little bit, again, they're no fault of his own, but they're just the fault of the offense. You know, uh, if you don't watch him play and, and study film on him, uh, you know, everybody, Darren Slack, we'll talk about him later on here in the next segment about uh, his, his deep ball ability. I think that you hear that a lot with, with Dylan Gabriel. We heard it from Rini and Golia last week in the live show. So maybe a looming decision, but uh, that's your, that's your pop quiz. Mike, I guess I, I might put this out as again, as a, as a bit of a, a survey test and kind of see where fans think on this stuff. I did survey monkey a bunch of times. I know it's kind of a pain in the ass because uh, you got to click a different link, but Twitter doesn't let me you know, have as many options as I want sometimes. So it's kind of hard to, to do that. So I'll figure out if we're going to put this out at some point, because I'm curious to get the, uh, the fan feedback, or you can just hit us up and give us your answer. If you want, uh, we'll always take that in any of our social media feeds, but coming up next, one of the first guys to ever do it. One of the best guys to do it early at UCF. Uh, you don't want to miss Darren Slack in the early years of UCF. Don't go anywhere. Sons of UCF. This is UCF Athletic Director Terry Mahajer, and in my spare time when I'm not on TikTok, I'm listening to Adam and Mike on the Sons of UCF. Go Knights and charge up. 
All right, Mike and I pride ourselves around here on trying to educate and inform uh, everybody out in UCF land. So if you're newer to UCF, you might have thought quarterback play started with Mackenzie Milton. And maybe if you go back a little further, maybe you think it started with Blake Bortles. All right, you go back a little further, maybe you even remember Dante Culpepper. Heck, you might even remember Darren Hinshaw, but what you probably don't know is there's somebody who's on the line with us tonight who literally set the foundation for UCF quarterbacks. Uh, 1984, 1987, this guy held almost every record at that point in time when he left UCF. He's definitely one of the legends of UCF and has continued to do a great job in the coaching ranks as well. So we are happy to have one of the original knights, one of the, one of the foundation layers of the program, Former quarterback Darren Slack is with us. First off, Darren, we appreciate you taking some time to walk down memory lane with us. Oh, that's an incredible introduction. Thank you, guys. I appreciate it. I wrote it myself, so you are you are most welcome. <laughs> so we let, can hang up now. Yeah, I'm all right, and we'll but talk to you next week. Something. <laughs> well, let's let's start here. Obviously, you came to UCF. Uh, obviously, in the in the very kind of the mid '80s, um, recruiting was way different back then, right? There was no huddle film, right? There was no DM and coaches. So, how did you end up? I know you're you're a local Orlando guy, but how did you end up coming to UCF? Well, I I was uh, fortunate enough to be an all-state quarterback at Lake Cal High School. And I was headed to the University of Pittsburgh on a big full-time scholarship, full-ride scholarship, and I was all excited about that. And then Poge Fazio came to my house, um, which was pretty cool, but he came to tell me that they were looking at some other guys and all that sort of stuff. So I kind of kind of grew sour on that opportunity. And that night, Bill Cubitt, who was the defensive back coach at that time at UCF, called perfect timing and said, Hey, you know, you got one visit left. I know you're excited about Pitt. Would you come visit UCF? So feeling like the, uh, the jilted boyfriend, I said, sure, I'll, I'll take that visit. And man alive, if I didn't feel like, you know, I was walking on the red carpet at UCF compared to what Pitt was doing to me. And so I just told my dad, I said, listen, I'm, I'm going to stay home where I can play soon and play early. And, you know, I always said I'd play at UCF and here I'm going to get a chance to do it. Why don't we just do that? And so I made the decision that weekend to, you know, sh- shift my commitment from Pitt to UCF and I never looked back. It was a great experience. And, um, you know, it was an interesting experience playing for Lou Saban. But uh, <laughs> after that, when Jim McDowell arrived, things got better real quick. So. Well, let's let's uh, we'll get to that in a second. Let's talk about the facility. So those who've been around campus now, you're used to that on campus <laughs> stadium. There's a beautiful new weight room, uh, Darren. There's even a nutrition center, I think, on campus. They have new locker rooms. They have all this stuff. Uh, take us back to 1983, 84, 85 when you oh were trolling campus. What what facilities did you guys have to work with? What a great question. I'm laughing because we dressed in in the uh, first fall I was there in the baseball locker room we didn't even have a facility to dress in. So <laughs> you didn't tell people you played for UCF football because they just introduced an athletic fee and the only facilities that were available because Jay Bergman was the dude at that time. And so, you know, baseball was everything at UCF. And so we dressed in the baseball locker room for the, for the first thing we were there. And then the Wayne Dench building got completed uh, very shortly after. So your freshman year in 1984, you mentioned playing for Coach Saban. He stepped down halfway through that year. What was the reaction of the team like when that happened? Um, you know, for the most part, it was relief. I mean, he was a pretty tough guy. Um, you know, we we had a lot of great assistant coaches that kind of softened the blow of Coach Lou. He was pretty intense and um, great recruiter, but a different kind of a coach. And so we all had to adjust to that you know, kind of mindset he brought to the table and uh, kind of left things in a lurch. And then when Gene arrived, things started turning around a little bit. So you did get to play a little bit there your freshman year. What was the biggest difference <laughs> I, when you came out I of high did. school to college? <laughs> oh, man, I'm laughing because I, I, you know, I told my dad, I'm going to play early, you know, and I didn't realize I'd play in the third quarter of my first game. You know, I was, I was so uh, shell shocked, you know about the intensity of the game. I, I mean, you know, there's an old joke that says, you know, when you, you leave high school, you know, you can eat the rubber off the tire, but when you get to college, you find out they eat the rim, you know, <laughs> it's, it's just a, a different animal up there, you know, because, you know, in high school, you get a one good highlight collision, maybe two, three a game. Well, everything in college is a highlight collision. 
everybody hits like it's a highlight film. And he didn't realize that because, you know, when I arrived, nobody hit me. I wasn't allowed to be hit because I was the scholarship, you know, golden boy. And so they didn't go live on me until the first game. I had to go in against Bethune Cookman. And the first time I got hit in the third quarter of the game was 22 all. The first collision I took was a concussion. I got concussed. And I, I thought, the first thing I thought was, is this how they're going to hit every time? I'll never survive, <laughs> you know? Um, and it was kind of funny because I played eight more plays with a concussion. We didn't have protocols and everything else. The guys stood me up in the huddle and drew their plays on the hand to uh, tell me what to do. And I drove the team 80 yards right down to the field. And and then I got hit on a play that they thought I got the concussion on but, and that I got, you know, drilled in the blind side. So I took a couple of major collisions early on uh, my first game and ended up playing the next week despite being concussed. So, yeah, it was uh, quite an interesting experience to play early at UCF. <laughs> Did like... you realize it was a concussion at the time, or did you find out after the game? Oh no, 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 no! no. I, I mean, I got sad. my, I didn't, I got my bell rung so bad, and the lights went out for a moment, and I came back, and I figured, well, if you, if you're not knocked out, you're good, right? You know, so <laughs> I, I'm, <laughs> I had no way of knowing that, you know, when you can't remember your name or the plays, that's not a good thing. Um, so what was interesting was is. After the game was over, they're like, hey, as a precaution, you got to stay up late and everything. So I had two very nice and very kind trainer girls stay up all night and talk to me. And that's all they did was keep me awake so that I didn't go to sleep. And uh, I didn't get to sleep until the next day because they were worried about, you know, my situation. But apparently it, it turned out to be a mild concussion, but it was it was a concussion nonetheless. And uh what was interesting was the next week was even worse. I got sacked nine times against Northeast Louisiana in the next game. Uh, it was brutal. So, yeah, it was. There was no such thing called a gang sack, or excuse me, uh, in the grasp at that point. So what they would do is they would hit me, and you would hear the guy say, "Oh no, 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 you can't go down." And I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And I'd get hit like three more times. And what they were doing was holding me up until their buddies arrived. It was kind of a thing that they had worked out amongst the defensive line that once you get to the quarterback, don't put him down, just hold him up and kind of drive him a little bit. And then we'll get there and, you know, we'll all take him down together. So I got gang sacked like six or seven of the nine times. It was brutal. I'd never been, I've never been around anything like that. So it was just really a uh, first couple of weeks as a, as a UCF quarterback, I wasn't sure I'd signed up for the good, for the right thing. <laughs> it sounds like we need to get you better pass protection is really really well, the moral was, of that too that was the uh that was the first thing we realized was there was not much pass protection <laughs> uh at that point so all right well in 80, 84 yeah. you survive luckily uh and then you I move did. and then you, you move into 1985 where you start uh earn the season you are in a competition with tony landon for the uh for the qb job for playing time for fans who don't understand it, you hear this all the time in sports. There's a QB competition. What does that really mean? How does how does that work out in your situation in '85 for you and Tony? What was that competition like? I'm impressed. You guys have done your homework. <laughs> um, Tony was a transfer from another uh, junior college, and uh, he was a great athlete. He had skills that I didn't possess. I was a little bit more of the kind of dependable, reliable, audible caller. I was the more you know, go-to guy to make sure the offense distributed the ball properly and got all the right calls made. Tony was kind of a uh, a little bit more uh, free spirit in the way he went about doing things. And it wasn't always fancy, but he, he was kind of a playmaker, you know, periodically, and they kind of liked that. And so we had very similar stats in the inter-squad game. And, and then um, we went back and forth the first season uh, in my sophomore year. We just – I started probably half the season and then I had a really bad game. And so I got benched and then he would play a while and then um, he would play bad. And then I got played. So we kind of shared time my sophomore year, not a great experience, but you know, we, we had some good memories and some good things that happened. We, we won a game in the last second against Valdosta state and some other things that occurred that I had a chance to be a part of, but I wouldn't say for Tony or myself, it was a very good experience. You know, normally in two platooning, you're, you know, you're trying to help the team and everybody wants to win, but they just didn't ever tell us what the situation was. So we didn't know up until game time who would play or whatever. And that continued into 
uh, my junior year, um, where I won the job out right in my junior year. And that was a little bit more of a, of a, a level opportunity, but nonetheless, it, it, it went on for, and then he ended up leaving the team, um, for personal reasons or whatever. And so by the end of my junior year, he was, he was out, but, uh, that went on for about a year and a half. Well, you mentioned your sophomore year, so that was a that was a tough season for you. Six touchdowns, fifty nine ints. I even read something where the Orlando Sentinel said you were getting booed off the field, and they were they were calling for the third string guy. <laughs> my mother, but my mother booed <laughs> me. It was bad. Well, how, how, how do you how do you take that? You, you mentioned earlier, right? You're you're coming there, scholarship guy. You think you're gonna you know get a lot of playing time, and this is gonna be a great opportunity. And all of a sudden, things are going well. You're getting booed as as a young college kid. Now, as an adult, maybe you understand that better. But as a college kid, how did you process that at that time? Kind of the struggles you were going through. Well, I'll be honest. I, I I don't know that anybody handles it well. I'm a I'm a man of faith, and I was head of FCA at that time, so I tried to have a good attitude and you know kind of lead other folks and be positive about it. But it was tough. I mean, the old part just didn't respond very well, and people don't like you know what you're doing. And it really wasn't all my fault. It was a lot of things that were contributing to the situation. It wasn't that we were bad players, but our confidence as a team was really low. And we, we were trying to do too much and too fast, in my opinion, with the new coaching staff and the new things that were coming in. And as a result, we just weren't producing. And, and you know, my tendency to try to make something happen and force things kind of led to some, some bad decisions and interceptions and things that didn't help the team either. So I, you know, I contributed my stuff to it. But I don't. I think it was just a matter of having to reshape the way we thought about the game, the way we did things. And I'm glad we were able to turn it around, but um, it was a combination of things. No one thing that did. And yeah, it was tough. Um, there were a lot of days that I wasn't real sure I wanted to be out there. Not for any other reason that it's just hard to keep going when you think everybody's against you. Coming off a tough season like that, does Coach McDowell sit you down and talk to you going into your junior year? Um, yeah. I mean, he, he, he had a unique way of kind of dealing with failure. Um, Gene was a, a master motivator in one sense. I mean, the first time I ever met him, he said to me, I wish you believed you were as good as I believe you are. And I never forgot that. I thought that was a really cool thing to say. And But then Tony Glenn shows up and it's kind of like, wait a minute, you know, um, you bring in this guy, and, you, know, you, you know, but he, he would always kind of spread that confidence. But if you show weakness or – you failed he was equally challenging to you about your uh, about your mindset and things like that so it would it'd be a bit of a trick to try to figure out which gene was going to be there to kind of pump you up but for the most part you know he he tried to figure out a way to get you to get out of your own head and play better and so he he would try all kinds of different psychological tricks <laughs> sometimes reverse psychology sometimes you know encouragement you never knew what you were going to get um Mike Kruzik, who came with him as my offensive coordinator and quarterback coach at that time, was probably more critical to the process because he was more, you know, elbows deep in what we were trying to do. And he was probably more instrumental in helping me turn it around than Gene was. Yeah, it's funny. Gia Cohn was telling us the same thing about Coach McDowell being the motivator that he was. Um, that's, that's pretty interesting. So what did you do in response in that off season? How did you get ready for the next season? Did you change up anything? Did you change your diet? Did you try to pack on some pounds? Or Oh, I, I think I had to gain some weight for sure. I was probably 20 pounds underweight, um, and I did. I put on 27 pounds between my junior uh, and sophomore. And I'm sorry, sophomore and junior. That was one of the things they asked me to do, and, and I did. Um I'll be honest, I lost a lot of weight due to the stress of the season and the things that I went through. Um, I went from 197 down to 172, 173. I, I was really losing weight fast, and they were concerned. Um, I, I shouldn't weigh that, you know what I mean? Even though I'm, I'm eating, it was just that was how bad the stress was. And usually stress makes you gain weight, but in my case, I was just losing it pretty badly. And so I put it all back on. And I came into the junior year much better prepared uh, and even better than that into my senior year. So I, I think, you know, once we got through some of those difficult times, we were able to make some changes. Yes, diet, mostly the weight room, though. I, I really became a, a, a faithful 
uh, weightlifter and started working out with Coach Kruzik, who, you know, I mean, oh, he yeah. has a history of being a tremendous <laughs> weightlifter. And, you know, I started working out with him in the morning. Now, I didn't work out with him, but I would be in there when he would be in there. I was like one of the only players that would be in there at the time. He'd be in there at five in the morning. And I did that to kind of motivate myself and kind of let him know that I was committed to what we were doing. And he, he got me a workout partner that was a buddy of his that was a, uh, you know, a, a therapist, a muscle therapist and a, a real stud in his own right. And he really helped me get the weight pack back on the right muscle structures and things like that. So I think it was instrumental in helping change a lot of those, those uh, physical attributes that I needed. All right, well, you mentioned it earlier. So going into your junior year, 86, uh, you get tabbed the starter, which I know is something you talked earlier about how important that was to you. How much confidence that give you? Because um, I, I guess, you know, even reading back in the history of a lot of people um, got on Coach McDowell and maybe thought that was a bad decision. How much confidence did, did it give you that McDowell looked you in the eyes and said, it's your ball? Well, it's funny. He didn't decide that until three minutes before the first game. Against <laughs> so we didn't know. I mean, they lean. They told me they were leaning in my direction after uh, the senior squad game, and it was again. It was primarily because of my handling of the offense. I mean, Tony was a tremendous athlete in his own right, but he, I, you know, I think even he would admit he wasn't as up to speed on what Mike wanted to do, Kruzik, as I was. So that ended up being a real plus in my corner. So. I could check and audible in ways that Tony couldn't. So it gave me an edge. I think they just decided to go with me and, you know, I was able to kind of put us in the right play, you know, which was big because Mike came out of a pro style situation and being at Florida state and, you know, out of the NFL and he always liked to change the play and he wanted somebody that could help him with that. And so that's what I did. Yeah. I was going to ask that and question. It worked out. How intricate yeah. was the Kruzek offense? Obviously, back in those days, it was, you know, three yards in a cloud of dust, and, and, and Mike was known, to your point, for throwing it around a little bit. How intricate was his offense? How, I guess, even from your perspective back then, what, what, do you think it was ahead of its time in terms of the schemes and, and the concepts he wanted to run? Oh, absolutely. There's no question. He, he was pure NFL. He brought the whole NFL playbook right into our situation. I mean, he, he, uh, he didn't mince any words either. It took him, he was amazed. He's kind of like, normally it takes me three weeks to install this, and I installed it in three days. And again, that, that goes to, at the time, the capacity that I had to retain information. Now, whether I could execute it all perfectly, that was different, but I could retain it, and I knew what was going on, so I could make the checks and do whatever. It was just, you know, um, and then Tony, I guess to keep up, he just kind of went with it, you know. Um, but Mike kept piling on because I could handle it. And, you know, over time, I think Mike even realized, though, that just because I could didn't mean the entire offense could. Hmm. And so going when we took that mindset into my senior year, uh, that's when things got really interesting. When he walked in one day and threw the playbook against the wall and said, we're starting over. Hmm. That happened after the first game of my senior year. So. Well, in 86, you guys started turning things around. You guys were, got off to a good start. And then there was a, an ugly game against Wichita State. I don't know if you remember this one. You lose 9-6. <laughs> oh, two field goals, an extra it point. It was brutal. Oh, it was it was the most brutal game I've ever been in my entire life. We uh, <laughs> we, we were we were in pregame. It was about 45 minutes before the game started. And, again, I'm amazed you guys know all this. But Wichita State was a Division One team at that time. And they were – well, they weren't a great Division One team, but it was a big deal that we were playing a Division One team, and we had, you know, all these great athletes that could run really fast. You know, uh, just burners, Bernard Ford and others. We were four 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 three four four two five in the forty. I mean, we had guys that could run, and they played man coverage across the board every down, but they didn't have the athletes to do it. And so we were like, we're going to throw for a million yards against these guys, and so we came out and shotgun that was the plan. So we show up, it's 35 minutes before game time and it's a nice day. And all of a sudden all hell opens up <laughs> over the press box and it rains a good old fashioned Midwest downpour. We're off the field. We can't even see the other team warming up. It's where I'm, I'm on the 30 and I can't see the other team. That's how bad it was. So we leave the field and it had been raining all week anyway, but 
we come back, the game's delayed for 30 minutes. We come back on the field and it's a swash. It's just, it's a puddle. The whole field's a puddle. And, you know, everything's nice and clean, but there's an inch of water on the ground. And so we get the ball on the three yard line on the opening kickoff. And the first three plays, I throw a 95 yard pass. I throw a 65 yard pass and I throw a 48 yard pass, all of which were called back for penalties. So I, we had we had one play go to the end zone. First play, I hit it over route, goes all the way to the end zone, fall back for holding. Next play, I hit uh, from the own two yard line. I hit a pass play that goes 65 yards, call back for some stupid thing, and then we called a third play, another penalty. And so, in addition to the sloshing of the water, we get three straight penalties in the first three plays. So that just shows you the kind of thing that started. And then right before halftime the heavens opened up again and this time it came with a brutal wind and the temperature dropped 20 degrees and so it's 35 degrees the field is pure mud i mean pure (laughs) mud i had up to 15 seconds to throw the ball i would drop back and then both offensive and defensive line would fall down (laughs) and i would stand back there and the receivers were trying to run routes but they would be falling down and I had a just a huge wind blowing, crosswind, and I would throw a ball and it would blow three yards to the left or three yards to the right. It was the it was the most nightmarish thing I've ever experienced. I had a long sleeve shirt on, it was ice cold, and you know, I'm just freezing, but I'm still just gutting it out because, you know, we got guys open all over the field, but it's it's like that worst nightmare you could ever have where guys are open but they can't stay on their feet. And they can't catch the ball because it's, it weighs 15 pounds. I can't throw it. And I, I'm not being knocked down, but it doesn't matter because, you know, I can't do anything. And so it was just awful. And so we kicked a field goal, uh, running the ball. We kicked, you know, then they ended up kicking one and we kind of went back and forth. And then like at the end of the game, they kicked one into the wind and it went straight up in the air and just fell in off the crossbar and they beat us nine to six. It was the most devastating loss uh, we had experienced that year because we just had really the upside uh, of all good things and then it kind of got ugly after that there were a number of things that went wrong yeah i'm sorry to bring up some bad memories (laughs) yeah well i mean that's just the beginning we lost to wofford that was the really the bad game that was the game where we lost on every 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 phase of the game against the team we had no business losing to and homecoming and uh i'd say that was probably the the one where I was told I'd probably never play at UCF again. Um, it was just a comedy of errors. Uh, brutal, just brutal. And uh, I have no one to blame but myself because I didn't play well. And nobody did. And uh, any number of things went wrong. Guys ran wrong routes. I overthrew receivers. Just stupid stuff. And, um, you know, these guys snuck out a victory on us that we'd never gotten. So I got benched uh, for I had played all the way through to that point, and I you know I was told you know don't even think about playing, and there was probably three or four games where I I was persona non grata. Um, that was three games I think, and then you know Tony decided he wasn't going to play anymore because he felt like he I don't know what I'm not even trying to speculate but he left the team without telling McDowell he just kind of announced it to the papers didn't even tell the coach and uh that didn't go over very well but and then all of a sudden i came back and we won 66 to 7 in the last game of the season and like it never happened you know everything <laughs> was fine you know <laughs> well uh, getting that win gave you guys a winning record at least you finished six and five did you think <laughs> yeah. maybe you were getting comfortable somewhat there with that last game well i think i don't know i think i think we just started to realize i mean I'll be honest. I, I mean, sitting for a couple of weeks probably did me some good. I mean, in the sense that the pressure alleviated, I was I was really getting to be a much better player, but it gave me some time to see the field differently. I did get some some mop up time in those games that Tony started, so I was able to figure some things out mechanically. I don't know. I just I just started to find my groove, and uh, you know, I I don't. I don't know why I was, you know, kind of given the the scarlet letter, if you were. But, uh, you know, I just, it, 
I guess, you know, a little bit of humility probably did me a good just to sit me down and let me think about it. But, um, you know, once I got back in there for good, it was, you know, I wasn't going to relinquish it anymore. Well, I was going to ask that. So 87 comes around, like you mentioned, Tony's gone. Uh, obviously did, did you feel more confident kind of knowing, Hey, this, this is my job now. This, you don't have to look over your shoulder. No more of the, is it you? Is it Tony? Did that give you kind of an extra confidence going into that 87 season, knowing that this was going to be your team? Well, we actually had a different situation than confidence. I was actually told that if we don't go to the playoffs, you know, the football program is probably going to be, you know, in trouble. You know, there was some financial issues that the program was experiencing. My father was instrumental in, in, in uh, eradicating those through the Night of Nights auction that I'm sure you guys are aware of. You've done your homework. Um, but he, uh, he did his part on the Booster Club to ensure that the program was viable financially. Uh, in those four years and raised a ridiculous amount of money for the program through that. And, but that senior year was kind of like it's fish or cut bait because if we don't win, then, you know, people are, are tired of propping up a bad program. And so I was kind of told it's the playoffs or the program mm. and we're going on your arms. So get ready. I wasn't kind of told that. I mean, that's kind of part of Mr. Mo- Mr. McDowell's motivation tactics, as I told you. You know, he visited with me one day and kind of told me that. And so, you know, I knew it was my job to to handle. It. And the only backup I had was really not going to con- not going to compete. My uh, Shane Willis came in as a freshman out of high school, and they were going to redshirt him. So, you know, it was me a so-so backup in Kevin Helms and, uh, and Shane. And so it was really just kind of like an NCAA rule. Mike said that you can't get hurt. <laughs> <laughs> so they, I, I got into games and I was still in the game. And I, I mean, referees had to take me out. Uh, we were beating a uh, team out of Michigan. Um, I don't remember the names. It was 67 to three or something. Yeah. And I'm just handing off to Giacone. I mean, that was the night Mark had his big breakout game. Um, the name of the team is escaping me, but he had 131 yards in one quarter. It was some ridiculous amount. He was carrying people. I was just handing off to him on the same. We were in the same play like nine times in a row. That's a uh, grand. Val- he was just grand Valley that's state. It, grand Valley. Yeah. 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 And the referees, they said you got to take eleven out because the the other team is looking to hurt him, so you need to you need to put him put him down. So they literally then had to take me out because the other team was plotting to injure me because they figured my still being in there was really not classy. Hmm. I mean, see, it you got to realize we were we were a good football team, but when we we went to the spread, we became a great football team. So we had a great defense. We had the nightmare defense. We were we were slated number five in the country, I think, going into our our first. It was the first time we were ever ranked in Division Two. We had athletes all over the field, and we beat the uh, put me like seventeen ten or seventeen fourteen or something. It was some low number, and Mike was very frustrated because we tried to run the ball and play conservative pro style, and he comes in on like the Tuesday after. And he just took the playbook, massive six-inch playbook, and just chucked it at the wall and said, we're starting over and we're going to do this. And he drew up five guys, empty set. I'd never seen anything like that before. This is the 80s, guys. You know, you don't see stuff like that. And he goes, we're going, we're going, we're running this. We're going to give you a four-yard head start. And I can't tell you we're going to be able to block for you. (laughs) You know, because we had three freshmen in the offensive line. And so he put me in the gun and he said, listen, you're going to have to stand in there, take the shot, make the throw. And that's what we did. We started running a lot of quick game, a lot of, you know, what really became today's horizontal RPO offense is essentially what we did in the eighties. And let me tell you, nobody could stop us. I mean, we scored 18 points in the first game we did in a matter of eight, a minute and a half uh, against Elon college. It was supposed to be a pretty good team, but we went out and just, they were they had called three timeouts in that 90 seconds because they had no idea who to cover or how to, how to defend it. They'd never seen it. And I had guys open wide, wide open all over the field. And so we immediately, you know, we only had five plays, you know, <laughs> but 
but it was just five devastating plays because everybody was open. And then by the end of the season, we had 50, you know, we just kept adding new stuff and everything like that. And so they figured out by the time we got down to Florida and M and some of these old school guys that the only way to beat this is to get to the quarterback. So they send, they started sending guys up the gut, you know, send four defenders through the a gap, you know, and that's how they got started getting to me. Um, before I could get the ball off, which created all kinds of issues and uh, started to expose some of the weaknesses we had in the offensive line and made it made my life a little bit more rough. But uh, <laughs> it was a big reason why we were very successful our senior year. We threw it over 500 times, so or thereabouts, like 483 times. Well, one thing, we, you mentioned Mark Giacone. We had him on the show uh, two weeks back, and one of the things he, he kind of rem- brought up for us that sort of we forgot but remembered is how challenging it was back in those days for you guys to beat Georgia Southern. Uh, UCF's 2-10 and ten all-time <laughs> against Georgia Southern. You never beat Georgia Southern in your career. Um, how much of a rival was that for you guys back in the day? How, how big was that? Was, was those ga- were those games for you guys against Georgia Southern? Uh, they were big every year. We, you know, because they were so good. I mean, they were the Division One AA darlings. You know, they they were awesome, and you know, we got to play them on our schedule. So, to play them was cool. My sophomore year, we were just kind of the whipping boy. But Tracy Ham was the quarterback, and he might be the best option quarterback I've ever seen. Tommy Frazier was great, but he was no Tracy Ham. Tracy Ham was the greatest option quarterback I've ever seen. And no, no down and distance situation was safe. Third and twenty didn't matter. He could create off of passes he could create off of plays and he he manipulated like the pied piper or anything our defense did and so you know you just had to keep up with them if you're going to score them so our senior year he was gone and so we go up to paulson stadium and we go down 25 to 7 in the first quarter just right off the bat and then we just in the second quarter we we came alive with the spread and went right down on him because we were going conventional for the first three drives didn't get anything. And then they put up three touchdowns real quick on our nightmare defense. We go down and then all of a sudden we go spread and it's over. We, we started lighting them up. Now I was getting drilled. I mean, somebody counted how many times I got hit. It was like 41 times out of 57 throws. Didn't matter. I was getting the ball off and we went right back and we went up late in the game, like 32 to 28, something like that. Or actually they went up to on us. Um, yeah, it was 30, something like that. And with, with 47 seconds to go in the game, they fumbled the ball on their own 47 yard line, which was just unheard of. I mean, the game was over. We just, we just came up short and we were frustrated because we had just fought our way back and we're in it. We get the ball back and, you know, I got Poe White on a post and, He's wide open, but he changes his route a little bit, so he kind of messed things up a little bit. And I pulled the string a little, and some guy came across and dove and picked it off, which, I mean, it went from touchdown in my head to a pick, which was just unheard of because I was so shocked by the receiver's decision. I think a lot of it came down to the fact that he was so amazed at how open he was that he went vertical instead of staying on his post route. And this miscommunication and the ball came off angle, and the guy made a great play. It was an unbelievable diving catch. That ended it, right? And so that was our one chance to beat him up there in Paulson Stadium. And, of course, I was vilified initially for having thrown the pick. I mean, I think that was the first day G. McDowell really considered killing Darren Slack. <laughs> um, he, he, came off the, he came off the field, and he was like, I had, I mean, he had words to say that I can't say on a nice podcast, um, <laughs> but he, I didn't say a word. I didn't say a word. I just, yes, sir. You know, and then he watched the film the next day and he came into the meeting room. And the first thing he said was, I need to apologize to Darren Slack. And he goes, Darren, I, I yelled at you. And he goes, you had no responsibility on that last play. And he drew up the play on the board and then he lit into Poe White. It was kind of sad what he did to Poe, but the reality is, is Bo kind of had it coming because of the, the what he did. But I was totally vindicated and exonerated. It just made it look really bad that I threw a pick to end the game. But it really wasn't laid at my feet, unfortunately. But who cares? We lost, right? But it's an interesting sidelight to we were always so close to beating Georgia Southern in those last two years. And I think we eventually got them a year or two after I left. Um, 
once we hit the one double a ranks i think our our guys started to step up and take care of business but yeah they were they were unbelievable uh, those few years we had the chance to play them well, you mentioned the offense catching fire. There's one game I'm sure McDowell did not yell at you afterwards. <laughs> the West Georgia game. You throw 417 <laughs> yards. And I, I often say this, going out, Bundy is scoring four touchdowns. You threw seven touchdowns in one game? How oh, yeah, I got, I got yelled at. I got yelled at. <laughs> oh, no. Oh, yes. I, was, I, got, I, got, I got yelled at for that more than probably some of the other things I did. Because here's <laughs> what happened. We were, we were up, and I was hitting everything. It was just one of those nights where – you know, we couldn't do anything wrong. We were, I just, every check, every throw, it was just beautiful. It's a wonderful night. And we had a lot of good things happen. And West Georgia is a good football team, but I was just on fire. Everything I threw was right on the money. And I mean, we, we had receivers that were in trouble and it didn't matter. I was just, you know, I was being very successful and, um, you know, I was grateful for it, but the last series we were doing just run the ball, run the ball. Cause it was 45, 14, right? Um, it was 45 to 14. Yeah. And <laughs> they came up in a fresh blitz. Mm-hmm. And I just, you know, when I saw that, I just triggered the, auto- the automatic, you know, blitz call. And we went vertical and I hit Bernard again for, for a touchdown. And man, I came off sideline and he lit me up. He was just like, you just cost us ever playing them again, and I'm going to have a good relationship with that head coach, and I'm going to get – I'm in big trouble, and that was the most selfish thing I've ever seen in my life. And, you know, Karuzic got me on the headset. He's laughing. He just thought it was the funniest thing. He's like, that was a great call, you know. <laughs> he goes, that was awesome, you know, great job, you know. Don't worry about that. He goes, you know, they, we, it ain't our job to keep the score down, you know. And uh, – but anyway – I was nominated Sports Illustrated Player of the Week that week, and it was funny. Mike Mike did all he could to keep my head small that week. I got in more trouble that week than I'd ever gotten in trouble with Mike. He was so tough on me as a coach because he was trying to keep my head out of head. Trying to keep me focused so that I wouldn't think more of myself than I ought to. It was really helpful, actually. <laughs> <laughs> Just uh, kind of pulling that reverse psychology on me, thinking better than I was. But, uh, yeah, it was a great game. Oh well, yeah, you toned it down the next week. You, you only threw five touchdowns the next week. <laughs> so, t- twelve touchdowns in two weeks. Being in a zone like that, does it feel different when you're out there and you, and are you just hitting everything? Oh, uh, when you're in the zone, it's it's like your the game slows down. It's what it feels like. I mean, if you can imagine what you've seen on movies and stuff, where they actually kind of, you know, you're just able to see things before they happen and all that sort of stuff, and everything. You're you know, always very calm and very relaxed and just, just in my own, you know, I had finally kind of, that was really the game where I really hit my stride, if you will. I mean, I've been playing well, but this was kind of the, the, the zenith or the apex, if you will, of that season. I was just, I think I threw five touchdowns the next week, you know, against Northwest Missouri. So I was kind of unconscious for a couple of weeks there. Just, we had really gotten into the, uh, the five wide, no huddle spread, and we were doing really well, and I really had a feel for it. You know, that's good things were happening. And like I said, that went on for four or five, six weeks. You know, they named the offense and the whole bit, the slack attack. And, you know, it got to be pretty exciting to be at UCF football games. But then, you know, once we started playing some more defensive-minded coaches, things got a little bit dicey, like I said. Better teams down the stretch. Well, in that Northwest Missouri game, you mentioned this name earlier, but I think a lot of UCF fans maybe aren't familiar with how, how great he was. Uh, Bernard Ford had a huge game. He had 208 uh, and four touchdowns. Uh, for those who maybe didn't see Bernard play or haven't seen any film or haven't even really thought about his name, how, how good was Bernard Ford? Well, he was the first real – I mean, Teddy Wilson was probably the first real wide receiver NFL prospect we had in my freshman year. He ran 4-3 and was a phenomenal athlete, but he was slight. He was small. Um, you know, Tyreek Hill small. Bernard was bigger – and fast. He was faster than Teddy and bigger. Um, and Bernard was really the true first, you know, I think he went with the, went to the bills, you know, in the third round or something, but he, he was legitimate. Um, four, four, three, four, two, five in the 40, he ran four, three, one in the combine. And he just made, it made him basically uncoverable in college. 
And so having him and Arnell Spencer and a number of other guys who are – and Donald Grayson at tight end, it's like having Gronkowski at tight end with a guy that – you know, two guys on the outside that can fly. And even Sean Becton was there as a freshman, you know, um, who is now the, the storied coach there at UCF. Um, you know, so all that was part of my team, you know. And it was really a privilege to have those guys because it made me look a lot better than it was. Yeah, you mentioned Becton. He was obviously a freshman on that on that '87 squad. Uh, he obviously legendarily had a bunch of big games, scored uh, touchdowns and, and uh, throwing, uh, receiving, running, uh, re- returning. I think in one game. Uh, how special was he? Did you did you notice or did you see that he was going to be something special as he was a freshman? Well, Sean really didn't come in too much until midseason, but you you started noticing right away that he had. He ran razor sharp routes and he had great hands. And once he got his feet under him, he went on to do great things. But it was very clear from the get go that he just needed he just needed time. And uh, he really contributed well. You know, obviously with Bernard and Arnell, those two guys were our featured bat featured guys. But you know, Becton came in and made a lot of great plays. So. Well, you mentioned you guys I actually saved the UCF program because you made the playoffs that year in 87. We won a game. How big was that moment at UCF when you were there? It was a big moment. I mean, we played IUPUI, which um, we had never heard of anything like that. It was <laughs> it was a strange football game again. Um, won't get into all the details of that, but they were a good football team. Um, Chorus Irvin can't believe I remember this, uh, intercepted a ball in the end to keep them from going ahead, but I think I'm going to tight with 12 to 10 or something. Yep. And then we ended up going and play the, uh, perennial juggernaut Troy state. Um, you know, they were the national championships four times in the eighties. Um, and so that was when we really kind of got into the reality. Well, you're still all over the UCF record book, seventh in passing touchdowns for career tied for sixth with, passing touchdowns in a season and then you got the record seven touchdowns in a game what what, what are you most proud of i think what the biggest one that i always kind of get a kick out is i think i'm still number one in interceptions thrown in one season <laughs> so i think that's the one i'm i, I tongue in cheek there obviously but it's the one my my kids never let me forget about my boys but um you know i think i, I certainly love the seven and touchdowns in one game but i you know records are made to be broken right i mean been a lot of great players that have come after me that have broken records and played much better than I ever did. I just was glad to make, make a contribution and, you know, see the program become what it is today. So while I get a kick out of, you know, some of the records still being there, um, I think the most important thing is that UCF's doing great and I still get to remember being a part of it. <laughs> so. Well, Darren, you now spend your days uh, as a coach, uh, coaching young quarterbacks. And, uh, you know, I read a bio on someplace that called you a quarterback guru. Uh, so what do you what do you enjoy most about working with young people and kind of working with young quarterbacks? Well, you know, my work with FCA gave me opportunities to train young men all over the place. And when I came out of college, the first thing I did was go to work with FCA. And the first step I made was to give something back. I started doing a quarterback camp to try to help out kids to – serve local coaches who just, you know, tried to help me in ways that I never had, you know, when we put, cause there really wasn't anything in the way of specialized training for quarterbacks in the eighties that nothing existed. And so I had this kind of idea that I could help. And, um, since then over 33 years, I've trained over 50,000 quarterbacks all over the world and, uh, built one of the largest, you know, most respected camp programs in the organ in the world through, you know, quarterbackacademy.com and, and, um, you know, we've gone through a lot of transitions, but it's been a real privilege because I've had an opportunity to go all over the world training young men and uh, been in five different countries doing it and also all over the United States. And I've got a great number of men that, you know, I've worked with. We probably certified over 300 coaches that have gone through our program and used our system and lots of others who know what we've done. And so, you know, we've been able to give something back. And that was always very, very important to me because I appreciated you know, I really appreciate what Mike Kruzik did for me to help me understand the value of learning how to play the game well. I didn't ever have any good coaching in high school. I was an option quarterback trying to play, you know, veer, veer football at Lake Howell. So when I got there as a throwing quarterback, I didn't have any coaching. And Mike was the first one that ever really kind of showed me anything about mechanics and kind of gave me a little taste for it. And I just took it from there and turned it into something that 
really kind of sport in an industry now. There's specialized training for quarterbacks in every city all over the country. So kind of proud of that. Well, since we have a, 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 a film expert, a, 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 an expert on the line, uh, UCF's got a pretty good quarterback right now in, in Dylan Gabriel. What do, you, what do you see when you watch tape on Dylan Gabriel, watch him play? What do you like about his game? Uh, Dylan throws one of the best deep balls of any young man I've seen in a long time, and he's got tremendous accuracy. Uh, he's got great poise. You know, that's always been one of the things I appreciated about him. And there must be something in the water over there in Hawaii because <laughs> between him and Milton, they just have gone back to back here in terms of, poise and productivity and that's what you want i mean and i think he's going to do very well with gus malzahn because gus is incredibly creative for the guy like that a very smart young man and dylan and a guy who can throw the ball plus all the little trickster stuff that gus likes to do he was the original trickster so it's going to be really interesting to see what they're able to come up with this year it should be a big year yeah, I was going to say, how, uh, how how proud are you of UCF and being one of the original kind of guys there? Obviously, seeing the success they've had over the last couple of years and, you know, from Frost, uh, even O'Leary from Frost, O'Leary Heupel, and now Gus Malzahn. Uh, how excited are you to be an alum of UCF and, and see the success they've had of late? Oh, I think I'm with everybody else, and I'd say it's it was kind of a foregone conclusion. We always knew they had the potential because of the density of athletes within the state. It just took a minute for them to figure out how to do it, and I think – once they figured it out, you know, people figured out that UCF was a great place to go to school and a great place to live. Then it was, you know, just took a great coach like Frost to kind of really turn it around and make them believe that they could be something. And I think Scott kind of turned the tide, you know, and I think George for, for all of his strengths and some of his weaknesses, I think he did a pretty good job too of kind of raising the bar. I think each guy made their contribution, but I think now it's kind of interesting because it's more of a, who can get us back to what Frost did? Mm -hmm. You know, I think Heupel always kind of had that over his head um, when he was here. You know, I wish him the best of luck, but I think he did a really nice job too with what he was what he was dealing with. Our biggest problem last year and has been for a while is our defensive secondary. Our defense has got to get really better. I mean, hopefully that's something that Gus focuses on. You know, we can't be so offensive minded we don't build our defense and. I think that's our greatest weakness right now. It's not quarterback or anything on offense. It's going to be our ability to stop people. And um, hopefully we can get that resolved this year. Are you able to, to get back out to uh, the games often? Have you have you been back in recent years? You plan no, on maybe I don't. Going back? I mean, I'm not as involved in a lot of that. My schedule doesn't permit me to, to do it. But I'll catch games on TV. And I'll, I mean, I'm like anybody else. I try to watch. I probably you know haven't been able to be as much of a, a, a game attendance fan you know, my responsibilities with my job and everything else, uh, trying to keep the dream alive, <laughs> as you guys can attest, sure. um, has kept me uh, incredibly busy for 30, 35 years because I've had to do multiple jobs to keep this QB thing alive. So I haven't really been able to become a fan. Um, not quite that wealthy, unfortunately. So <laughs> 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 I don't think I could afford going to UCF games, to be honest. <laughs> But, uh, you know, good for them. I'm excited, and, and uh, certainly they deserve it. So, Well, we appreciate you taking so much time and, and walking us down memory lane. But before we let you go, we end every interview around here with just some fun, random, rapid-fire questions. Could be music, movies, sports. Uh, you never know what you're going to get. So, uh, so here's my first one for you, okay? You can only pick one of these three things. You ready? Okay. All right. Pancakes, waffles, or French toast for breakfast? Which one are you picking? Oh, man, French toast all day. A good call. No one ever goes French yeah. toast, and that's always my guess. That's a really good yeah. answer out of you. Very good yeah, job. French toast. Yeah, good job. Uh, I'm going to stick with some food here. Say you got a Saturday afternoon, you get a few hours to sit on the couch and just watch football. What's your favorite food to eat while you're watching a game? Favorite food to eat? Yeah. Oh. You, are you a big wife. sandwich guy, chicken wings? Oh, no. It, it, it could be. It's a, it's a toss-up between Victorio's wings on – dog track road which are some of the best wings ever made and that's just a plug for them <laughs> or my wife's incredible ham and cheese sliders she makes these to die for butter covered slash seasoned garlic ham and cheese sliders man that are just oh it's unbelievable how good they are so that would be my two toss-ups right there all right. When you were at UCF, when you yeah, I'm hungry too now. When you were at UCF, obviously it's a lot different than, than what people know of it today. What was your go-to hangout spot when you and the guys wanted to just let loose, maybe have a, have a good time? Where was your uh, where was your hangout spot? There was only one. 
the wild pizza. <laughs> that was the only place to go on campus. There was one restaurant over by the common area and that's where everybody went. And that's where you went and got your late night pizza. And that was it. I mean, we would all go down there and get a, get a pizza and, and that was it. You know, 10 o'clock, there was one restaurant and that's it. It was either that, if you went off campus, you can only, you know, if you wanted to go on a date or anything, it was only Michael's restaurant. Everything else was, there was nothing within that corridor on Alafea or 434 there and nothing on university. So, you know, that was, it was, people were starving. I mean, <laughs> we would, we would literally, you know, take food, stick it in our jackets and stuff. Cause you know, we did all we could cause you have a big meal after practice. It was brutal, but then you had to you get 10 o'clock. You're hungry again. Right. So if you didn't have any money, you were starving. And so, you know, whatever money I had or whatever I do, you just get a pizza at 10 o'clock, a whole pizza and just kill that, you know, but that was our big hangout. Yeah. The wild pizza. There was no night out pub back then either. Yeah. They had a, they had a pub for, for guys that wanted a party. That wasn't my scene, but I mean, there was, there was no, I mean, I wasn't really a wild man, so I couldn't probably be the one to answer that. Gio could probably help you more there, but <laughs> I was, I'm not a, I wasn't the guy to go to on that, but I just know there wasn't a lot there was probably a pub or two around, but it wouldn't have been anything that, um, that I would have been aware of. I'm just saying that for the normal, you know, college going student, there was this student, maybe the fraternities, if you were a part of the fraternities, they'd have some great parties, you know, pie kappas and stuff. But other than that, it was pretty lean. (laughs) All right. What's your one dream vacation spot? Uh, I've been to Maui and that's, uh, I tell you that kind of, killed me for everything else i've been to paris i've been to a number of places but uh maui wins the wins the day on that one this is an unbelievable trip all right so since you obviously have a technical background in football you you know what good football looks like you know what uh fundamentals look like what's the best football movie of all time in your opinion oh man that's a tough one man alive best football movie like, well you- obviously remember the titans is up there yeah okay I mean, that's I'm probably going to have to just, you know, right off the top of my head, I have to say that one for like, me. I, do you get annoyed when you fan. when you watch the, like some of the football movies and you can tell it's just not technically accurate, or you can tell it's kind of sloppy? Like, does that does that bother you at all? <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, it, it, it. I always get a kick out of it. I, you know, I will talk to the television screen <laughs> when I'm a, I'm kind of a movie buff and a, I'm a TV and video producer, so I do have a, an inkling in that area, and so. I am always commenting at the at the television screen about what's real and what isn't. But um, yeah, I mean, it, football movies is very difficult to to get a, an authentic look. But um, remember, the Titans did a good job. Yeah. And yeah. there's a couple of others that aren't are escaping me at the moment. But we'll just go with that for now. Like any given Sunday, Jamie Fox is the quarterback and LL Cool J is the running back. <laughs> I just couldn't buy into that. I'm sorry. I mean, it was, it, they tried. I just couldn't buy LL Cool J as my well, my third down back. Who can, who can, who cannot be motivated by Al Pacino's speech? You know what I mean. So, yeah. <laughs> uh, just how we roll, man. Have you ever had a coach wear a leather jacket on the sideline, or was it just him? No, Gene was never that wild. <laughs> okay. So, okay. <laughs> all right, take us back to 1986, 87. What song are you listening to to get you pumped up for the game? Oh man, there were a number of 80s tunes that we would always listen to. You had ACDC, and you had all that stuff playing back in black and all that back in the day that would have been blaring over the, the loudspeakers before the game. Um, I was kind of a, I was different that way. I didn't really listen to heavy music because being a quarterback, I had to stay calm. So I didn't listen to a lot of hype, hype stuff. I listened to a lot of quiet music. Actually, I, I went the other route because I needed to calm down. So I listened to a lot of quiet stuff and try to keep myself focused so I'm probably, again, not the guy to ask there. <laughs> uh, but we always had stuff playing, but you know, in the loudspeakers to kind of fire the, you know, ACDC and all that before the game started. So, Well, Darren, it's been a real treat, a real pleasure um, hearing uh, your memories of UCF and taking us in the, in the way back machine. Uh, definitely enjoyed uh, the, the history lesson on all things UCF. And obviously, you're one of the guys who, who got it all started. And uh, UCF's obviously in a spot today, but uh, you're, you're a big part of that, too. So, Oh, man, you guys are so great to remember all this stuff. And thanks for going the extra mile to learn, you know, a little bit about what we were. Because, you know, it was an important time. And I'm honored that you guys would take the time to remember all that. Because it, it wasn't – we didn't realize at the time how important it was. 
because it really was what we feel like would have been uh, a fulcrum or a pivotal time for UCF football to prove itself to the board of trustees that it was worthy of sticking around and worthy of investing in. And so that was probably why I was probably the last class. Well, we were the last class in division two. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, we were the impetus that, you know, going to the playoffs and making a big stand and all that stuff gave the people the confidence that we could become the program that they, they believe they could invest in. So, you know, I'm glad to have been part of that. Well, we're, uh, we're glad you are as well. And again, appreciate you taking some time and hopefully we'll catch up with you down the road real soon. Okay. Great. Thanks a lot for your time, guys. Thanks, Derek. Thank you. Mike and Adam, sons of UCF, that'll move those chains. That's good enough for another UCF first down. All righty, cow of the week will be here in just one moment. Mike Darren Slack, a, uh, uh, a UCF legend, uh, one of the guys who held a, a boatload of records uh, back in uh, back in those early days. Obviously, a lot of it have been erased now by some of the bigger quarterbacks that we've had come through in the other offenses, Mike. But uh, really interesting stories. A couple I didn't know. I didn't. You know, he makes it seem like they were told, "Hey, playoffs or this program's dead." That's a lot of pressure to put on a guy. Uh, or on a team at that point, obviously, in, in UCF Purdue. So you think about how close – you and I aren't talking right now if, uh, if, if he doesn't go to the playoffs that year. So uh, there, there's, there was a lot riding on that one. <laughs> yeah, I mean, think about it. And also, um, with the passing of Bobby Bounded this past week too, he played a role at UCF staying alive back then. In those years where he donated a lot of equipment and, and stuff for the program to survive, so it wasn't just making the playoff. I think we actually we, we could barely even afford it. And G- Coach Dean McDowell, I think, took a salary of one dollar mm-hmm. back then yep. to keep the program alive. So a lot of guys had their hand in it. Darren Slack had a big hand in it by having the team be successful. Yeah, just a lot of cool stories about the early days of uh, of the program and kind of what they went through and some of the some of the battles they had and. Uh, it's cool to, to kind of hear that stuff now, and then you see where UCF's at. Uh, again, you know, that's the cool thing about being a part of UCF, Mike, is that, you know, Alabama, there's nobody alive when Alabama's football program started, right? That's 100 years old. Uh, so to be able to actually talk to people who were part of the very early history of, uh, of UCF football, and, uh, and they can give you, you know, recollection of games and plays and scores, that's a cool part about being, a, uh, you know, associated with a young university like this. Yeah, that's right. And we get to see all these things. Um... As they happen, some schools are a hundred years old and you, you never know any of those stories. So, All right. Well, let's, let's know some cows this week, Mike. Uh, obviously what we do is we find something, someone's, uh, some persons, whatever that uh, we think is cow worthy in honor of our friends, the cows, Mike. And I have a feeling this one for you may stay close to home. So who do you have for cow of the week? I guess I gotta do it. I've done it to myself before. I guess I gotta do it to myself again. Um, you know, I'm, I'll be a cow. Okay. Okay, okay. But for a good reason, I mean, the United States basketball team, I have said for weeks now that they were not even going to make any medal. They weren't going to get the gold, the silver, the bronze. They looked like crap in the uh, couple exhibitions early on, losing to, who was it, Australia and uh, France early on. Nigeria. And... Okay, Nigeria. <laughs> they bounced back, man. They bounced back, and when it counted, they pulled it together, and they and they got the gold. They brought the gold home. So good for them. Um, you know, that it's not the dream team that we're used to. It's not the 92 dream team that went out and beat everybody by 60 points. The, the final, I actually watched the gold medal game. Yep. Um, I was kind of falling asleep because it was on very late, but I, I did stay up to the very end. And, you know, it was a close game, competitive game. France was right in there the whole time. And, you know, we're not, I and mean, we didn't send our best team, let's be honest, but, you know, the guys are able to find a way to get it done. Everybody can apologize to, um, uh, I'm sorry, what's his name? <laughs> the, uh, how do I Greg Popovich? Popovich, Popovich. <laughs> uh, everybody can apologize to him now. But um, we're getting clo- the rest of the countries are getting closer to us. And that's just a fact, I guess. But uh, good job by the American team bringing home the gold and making me the cow of the week this week. Yeah, actually, I, I, I taped it and watched it the next morning because I know I was going to stay up the entire time. And uh, Kevin Durant uh, clearly proved that he's the you know the best player walking the planet right now. Maybe the best player not named LeBron, but 
Uh, I mean, he, he played really well, Mike. It's always funny when you watch those competitions because, um, you know, it, it's the, the, the guys who were on, uh, you know, some of the other countries, uh, Evan Fournier, I don't think he ever played that good in his life. And he became like a, like, you can't leave Evan Fournier alone. And I was like, what's happening to this parallel universe where Evan Fournier is, uh, is killing people. But, uh, it's, it's tougher, Mike, cause these guys play together, uh, on the international side all the time. Right. And we, we throw a group of guys together kind of last minute and say, Hey, let's make it happen. Uh, and, and you saw those struggles throughout the way, but you know, at the end, I guess talent will win out. And, uh, and when we had the most talent on the floor, it was close. Uh, and, and there certainly were some hiccups, but, uh, you, you, I agree. You got to feel like the world is creeping closer. Luka Doncic and Slovenia played really well. France played well. I mean, we had no answer for Rudy Gobert. Um, and he was just dunking on anybody he wanted to. So you definitely see the, uh, the, the international, uh, side of, of the business kicking up. And I feel like 2024 is going to be a, a, a dog fight out there in Paris. Right. And I guess, does this make the women's soccer team the cow? <laughs> you know what? Weren't they supposed to win this thing? They were. Who did we yeah. lose to? Canada? Uh, Canada, yes. Oh, Canada. Canada in soccer? Yeah. I mean, you didn't see that one coming. Nobody did. So. Yeah. Came up with a, with, a, with a bronze, I think, actually. It was their final medal. Yikes. That's not good. Yeah. I mean, women's basketball won, right? They, they, they blew did. everybody out. Yeah, women's basketball won uh, pretty handily the next night. Uh, so we took home both golds there. I think that's four Olympics in a row, maybe, um, because we lost the O oh, two thousand Olympics. But I think we've uh, we've I'm sorry the O four Olympics, but we've won everyone since then from the men's side. And the baseball team finished silver. with the silver. Yeah, yeah they lost two nothing to Japan. Yeah, that's a tough, tough one. one. That was a tough one. What are you gonna do? Yeah, I'm not gonna do much. Uh, all right, so Mike, Mike's gonna eat some crow on this one for Cow of the Week. Mike, I, I wasn't sure where I was going with Cow of the Week. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go with a serious note for Cow of the Week. Mike, my Cow of the Week is is COVID nineteen. That's what I'm gonna go with Cow of the Week here. I, I wasn't necessarily sure if I was gonna share this or not, but uh, on a little personal note, me and the family have been dealing with a bout of COVID over here for the past uh, week or so. Uh, my little guy, eight year old, brought it home first. And then gave it to my wife and I. She's uh, sort of on the on the downswing. She's doing okay. Uh, I still got a couple of days left going through it, um, so you can kind of hear it in my voice a little bit. But uh, let me just uh, COVID's the cow of the week, and let me just share for everybody out there: um, do, do what you can to avoid getting it. Yes, uh, it's it, depending on who you are and your symptoms. It'll be vastly different from all of us. But everything that you've heard about it is true. Loss of taste, loss of smell, fever, chills, all that good stuff. And and not a political statement, but um, I'm, I'm not ashamed to let you all know I am fully vaccinated, as is my wife. So this turned out to be one of those breakthrough cases. And uh, in some respects, maybe that saved us from going through anything worse. Who knows? Uh, but really, my message to everybody is just just be safe, whatever your version of safe is. And I'm not here to tell you what to do with your life and how to lead it. But be safe, whatever your version of that is. Uh, be smart, whatever your version of that is. If that means you want to wear a mask and vaccinate, great. If that means you think you can fight it off yourself, great, do that. Whatever your version of smart and safe is, just do those things and take care of each other because the reality is it, it, it's still out there. Um, while it, it may not be a, uh, a huge thing and, and something you can get through pretty easily, um, you don't really want to do it anyway, right? It's not fun, particularly for those of you with kids. Uh, so having an eight-year-old come home, test for it, was definitely a bit of a surprise for us. So obviously the, the younger kids are un, unable to protect themselves from a vaccination standpoint. So, um, you know, obviously monitor your kids. But COVID-19 gets my cow of the week because it's really kicked my ass these last two weeks, Mike. But hopefully we're on the uh, we're on the downswing. But really, my message to everybody is just just take care of yourselves, be smart, um, you know, be safe, do the right thing. Uh, that way we can all keep enjoying football and all the other fun stuff. Uh, but you know, just just be safe, and if you can avoid it, try to because it's not fun. And your daughter never tested positive for she escaped no. this. Summer? Yeah, no. Luckily, she's been social distancing since she was like eleven. Uh, so she just stayed in her room and <laughs> never came out. <laughs> would just text us when she was going to the kitchen, and we would all vacate from that room. Uh, so yeah, she, she luckily stayed downwind of it. So three of the four of us got, uh, got taken out pretty good. All right. And if you're a member of the dungeon, you read the news of one of the guys that posts in there all the time, yeah. um, passed away last week from COVID, a uh, very sad story. Young guy, yeah. uh, younger than us yep. with a family and kids. And that, that's the worst thing that can possibly happen, obviously. And you feel bad for the kids that are left back and, his family, what they're going through, and just, I mean, why do you want to put yourself or anybody in that situation? If it's preventable, do what you got to do, you know? Yeah. Just go get get, get a shot. It's not going to hurt you. It, uh, the conspiracy theorists out there, I mean, what, the government's putting something there? I don't know, man. Get, get, <laughs> if it's going to save you from dying, I mean, just, just do it. I did it. And you know, I, when it first came out, I was 
I didn't do it right away. I, I was kind of worried just because they didn't have enough testing on it or whatever it was. And uh, I was a little nervous at first, but you know, I ended up doing it. And I feel much safer now going out in public, having it. Having it. And if I do catch COVID like you, you know, it, it may not be as bad as it could be. You know? So yeah, I, I know somebody else too. That's it. He's been in the hospital for over a month now. Another young guy, 35 Thanks. years old. He's got three kids. He, He's on a ventilator. It's okay. just not something you want to deal with. Yeah, again, if you can avoid it, avoid it. Vaccinated or not, uh, I mean, uh, again, uh, perhaps a vaccine uh, prevented it or made it so that my wife and I did not have to go to seek any treatment outside of that. We were able to kind of do it here at home in the house and sweat it out and, and you know, just kind of get over it. I, I will tell you, I still have some lingering breathing issues, uh, which I can absolutely feel. Uh, I'm not I'm not an Olympian by any stretch, but I, I, I like to work out a, a bunch, and I can definitely – I tried to do some jumping jacks the other day and, and that was a bit of a challenge. So there are some, some things to it. Again, just, just be smart and be safe. Again, I'm not here to tell you what that means. You do whatever your version of smart and whatever your version of safe is. Uh, again, I know what mine is and hopefully it's part of, uh, the reason why, you know, while it's not, it hasn't been a fun week, it's, it's been a week that, you know, I can recover from quickly and move on with my life and not have to deal with you know, some of the repercussions that other folks have on the negative side. So COVID-19 gets my, gets my cow of the week, Mike. And, uh, uh, hopefully everyone out there just stay safe again this you know this delta thing is definitely real you, you don't tune to mike and i for your medical advice of course but um just stay safe because we want to see everybody september 2nd for that tailgate mike that's really what this is this is a selfish plea so that as many people as possible can come hang out with us uh september 2nd at the tailgate that's right if i somehow catch this thing and i'm not able to make it to that game i'm gonna be devastated yeah <laughs> that's i've been looking forward to this for a couple of years now because last year i didn't go to any games I, I mean the bulk of all, but I didn't get to go up to Orlando for any games. I haven't been in the in the stadium for a while, and I'm really looking forward to this. I'm really looking forward to the tailgate and hanging out with everybody, people we haven't met yet in person, and uh, it's going to be a good time. So hopefully this does not get in the way of any of that. And hopefully it'll be a good game, Mike, because we are uh, we are now uh, again. I think it's now Kevin Smith number of days away. I don't even know anymore. My math is not good, so I think we're 24, 25 days away from kickoff. Uh, again, we will try to keep you as covered as we can. Uh, not a ton of news coming out of the uh, uh, of the of the practices, but obviously press conferences, anything that we hear that we can talk about, we will relate to you as always. Our man Trace Troco has been uh, Johnny on the spot. He's been a lot of these pressers getting some videos, getting some pictures. So as best as we can keep you updated from that standpoint, make sure you're following Trace at SignPez. Uh, you can see a lot of his handiwork out there. And then on Thursdays, the Sons of UCF Live, we'll be back on this Thursday, Mike, where we will uh, dissect whatever is going on in UCF land at that point, maybe in uh, the official naming of a stadium sponsor. Uh, who knows, maybe a new recruit or two. I think some guys are scheduled to announce soon. Uh, so tune in and uh, see what we got cooking Thursday. Again, as always, we appreciate you for subscribing to our show feeds, wherever you find your podcast and following us on all the social media stuff, including our website, Mike, two nights, media.com. That's right. We got a lot of places where you can catch us on. So start subscribing. Uh, our subscriber numbers have gone up uh, every week. I check the uh, YouTube, that number is going up and our downloads every week are going up. So, that, that's good to see and I think now with football season right around the corner it, it, things are really going to pick up for us here we will try to be your one home for all things you need UCF related but I uh, uh, hope you enjoyed Darren Slack and everything else and the, and the quiz and all that stuff the preseason sunnies again check for that maybe coming out soon for everybody and uh, and definitely check for Thursdays Suns of UCF Live but we'll be back then until then everybody have a great week stay safe take care of each other be smart and, uh, and we'll see you then everybody go Knights charge on